My name is Kali Warren, and I am assistant professor and special collections librarian for University of Illinois Chicago Special Collections and University Archives. And I'm going to turn on my camera for you too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my co-organizer and the director for the Institute for the Humanities, Professor Mark Canuel and I welcome those returning and those joining us for the second and last day of the Different Archives, Different Histories Conference. This morning's programming includes an amazing panel and keynote speaker, and this afternoon we have a roundtable discussion and a keynote speaker to conclude the conference. For this morning, the panel discussion is on ephemerality and preservation. The moderator for this discussion is my colleague, instructor and digital publishing librarian, Janet Swachino. She is also the co-director of the Digital Humanities Initiative. I will now turn things over to Janet. Hello, um, like Kelly said, I'm Janet Swachino, I'm the digital publishing librarian. And I'll just start off by um, thanking Kali and Mark and all the other uh, Humanities Institute folks for organizing um, these really wonderful panels. Um, and it's a privilege for me to be able to moderate one. Um, so I will, uh, I will introduce the panelists now and then as we move throughout the session, I'll introduce the individual presentations. Our first speaker today is Dr. Kishona Gray. Dr. Gray is an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She previously served as an MLK scholar and visiting professor in Women and Gender Studies and Comparative Media Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Gray is an interdisciplinary intersectional cultural production, video games, and black cyber feminism. Our second panelist is Professor Jane Rhodes. Rhodes is, a tra is trained as a mass media historian with special specialization in African-American history and culture. She focuses on the study of race, gender and mass media, the history of black press, media and social movements, and African-American women's history. She is particularly interested in how aggrieved communities have used print culture, film, electronic media, music, and other expressive cultures as modes of resistance and empowerment. Her work also explores the gender politics of African-American communities and the experiences of transnational Black subjects. The third speaker today is Deborah Gray White. Deborah Gray White is the Board of Governors Professor of History and Professor of Women and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. During her 26 years at Rutgers, she has not only been a teacher, but a co-director of the Black Atlantic Race, Nation, and Gender Project at Rutgers Center for Historical Analysis, a research professor at the Rutgers Institute for Research on Women, and chair of the History Department. Professor White is the author of Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South. So welcome to all our participants, and I will now turn it over to Kishana Gray, who will present on streaming, digital storytelling, and Black practice in digital gaming. Appreciate you, Janet, and appreciate you all. I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning. Um, I haven't been up at nine o'clock in a little while, so thank you for adding some different dynamics to my life. Um, I'll go ahead and share the screen. We do have access to do so, correct? Okay. I will sharing now and starting the show. Um, whenever I was um, first asked to, uh, to, do, to do this work, um, and especially when I got the, the theme, uh, ephemerality and preservation, I immediately thought about the black women who were in these spaces that uh, allow me to be in their spaces in online gaming environments. Now, I know most of you all probably are not gamers and might not understand, you know, like a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, but we can liken um, the spaces that black women uh, create and curate really as like, like a beauty salon or like a kitchen table or like them being in a church or a mosque, you know, just them, the spaces that are safe for them 
gym and where they're hanging out and um, sharing and engaging with one another. Um, I wanted to start off, you know, with a bit of a um, of a story um, to to give to to provide some context because what I wanted to talk about in these fifteen minutes and please let me know if I've gone over. My bad, I didn't time this at all. Um, but whenever. Um, there were several things happened um, around 2014. So 2014, you know, really witnessed, you know, the reemergence of um, of Black Lives Matter. But it also um, was the moment in which Gamergate was happening. Now, some of you may not know what Gamergate is. Um, so here is a slide that kind of like indicates that. But during that time, it was a very precarious situation for black women in particular, right? You know, so they were, a lot of them, you know, were out protesting like in the streets, um, you know, like in Ferguson and Baltimore. And then they were also experiencing the invisibility associated with Gamergate. So Gamergate was essentially a harassment campaign um, uh, against women who wanted to, um, to, you know, talk about like the representations of like women in, in video games, right? And so there was like a um, a particular way that black women were rendered invisible because they were not a part of these conversations. And there was even a really amazing um, uh, write up from a Muslim woman who said, um, yes, oh, because I want to make sure you know that the Gamergate, Gamergate was really focusing on, and then the responses to it was fo focusing on the harassment of white women in particular. So women of color, um, because of the intersecting nature of, of our identities and the way that we experience like oppressions, um, they were rendered invisible because um i all i always say that gamers don't mind being called sexist they but they didn't want to be called racist now that has changed you know really like in this era that we're in um but i think it was really fascinating that you know a lot of things were happening so i just want to read just a little bit um if i can it's not i promise it's not it's not too long and it's super interesting i promise so on a winter morning in 2014, four women met digitally in an online forum to discuss their varied experiences within the onslaught of the Gamergate campaign. Gamergate began as a problem surrounding ethics in video game journalism, where intimate relationships influenced the objectivity of video game reviews. This quickly devolved into a harassment campaign against women by men who were being forced to accept the inclusion of women and increased diversity in video game narratives. These four women, who identify racially as Black, mostly express concerns over invisibility as they recognize that white women's experiences with harassment were privileged. These women also employed the hashtag, solidarity is for white women to express concerns on being ignored while experiencing intersecting oppressions, harassment, and hostility online. On a spring morning in 2014, these same four women met physically in New York City to support a rally for Rakia Boyd organized by Black, hashtag Black Lives Matter. This movement subsequently led to the Say Her Name campaign, a national call of action for Black women and girls who are victims of police violence. This specific protest was heavily criticized for failing to generate a critical mass, a signal for some of the lack of seriousness taken of women as police violence. The turnout for this protest, in contrast to the one for Eric Garner in the same city or Freddie Gray in Baltimore during the same time, reflects the devaluation of Black women's lives. And as one woman articulated, it's like we're out of place, like we're taking up too much space. Our concerns and voices are never heard, but we show up and show out all the time for Black men. We're like space invaders. Until some work needs to be done, then they call us. This concise and powerful comment was made after the Rakia Boyd rally. Renisha, also known as Tasty Diamond 21 on Xbox Live, these are all pseudonyms, you can't find these folks, sent this Facebook messenger text to me while remarking on how few people showed up to the rally, a stark contrast to the Eric Garner rally. And in this small statement, she uttered a common refrain that Black women hold about their experiences within social movements of being ignored, overworked, and undervalued. Um, I wanted to um, to focus on um, in that moment in that rally. Um, a lot of these women utilize different technologies, right? So we we started. It, it was really interesting how we all found out um, what was happening. Let me go to. I think I took the excerpt from from that um, from that. So whenever most a lot of us were gaming when this particular group of women found out that the person, um, the police officer um, who killed Rakia Boyd, was let go. And so it was just, we were in the space playing a game called uh, Mirror's Edge, I believe. And so we were just playing, talking about the game. And then all of a sudden, you know, this is an excerpt from that conversation. All of a sudden we hear, y'all, they just let this motherfucker go, right? 
And so, and then in, immediately everybody knew, you know, what was happening. So, you know, they were talking back and forth, you know, they were, um, they started sharing like posts like from Twitter and they were sharing posts like on Facebook. Um, and then like immediately, you know, like, you know, folks were organizing, especially like the, the women who were, um, who were in, um, who were in Chicago, you know, they like immediately organized so they could get down like to the courthouse. Right. And so it was really interesting just to see how this played out in the gaming space, but something, um, so this space, you know, most of the women, you know, identify this space is a private space. So they're in private party chats. And so they're just talking amongst one another. Now, it's so interesting to see, like, whenever these women decide to move from that private space to the public space, right? So they move just a bit differently. So in these private spaces, you know, they, they speak freely about, about things. They spoke freely about, you know, how they felt, for instance, about, like, Bill Cosby and R. Kelly and Kanye West. You know, they spoke freely about, you know, like, the violence of, um, of what, like, Chris Brown, you know, did to Rihanna. Um, and so it's really interesting just to see whenever they shifted into like the public spaces they were a little bit more guarded and protected about about what they said right and so it was like in these moments you know where they where they recognized that okay like um they, they made the intentional move to like rally around the race right so a lot of times they wouldn't talk about gender but then when rakia boyd happened they started to insert like conversations and especially when say her name you know started to mobilize they started to like insert themselves in really interesting ways um so there was another now i don't have screenshots of of the next part because um, I'm really focused on um, when um, when black women, you know, make are in uh, public spaces and then they make themselves like try to um, find some private spaces and um, to protect, you know, their private thoughts and private engagements. And this is through Instagram stories, right? So if you all are familiar with Instagram stories, you know that this is ephemeral technology, right? So in that particular, um, in one of those protests, um, black women were criticizing black men very heavily. Now they didn't post this stuff like on their Twitter. They didn't post this on the Facebook pages, but they posted it on Instagram stories is knowing that it would probably most likely not be seen and it would um and it would like go away like within 24 hours and so i thought this was like a very fascinating way and like a usage of how they were just in this public space but still needed some privacy to just say um yeah especially like with the rakia boy you know rally you know they didn't want to say negative things like publicly about it um but they were they were also talking about just like like nobody's here nobody's showing up and you know it was like different different conversations but very similar like you know for different rallies that soon began to pop up and, and emerge you know across the country so i thought it was like just like a really fascinating way how they use their their social um their social media but how they also um you know so i frame you know what they do inside gaming spaces the private spaces um as like as intersectional counter publics um and so i frame it in this way because it, these are the spaces where they're able to talk about you know their different uh their different gender identities in a way that might not be safe like in other spaces or they talk about you know their sexualities you know especially for a lot of these women who might not be out in physical spaces you know so these are the spaces that they create that offer uh, offer different protection now something really interesting also happened with uh, with xbox live um just a few um around 2013 2014 um xbox you know a lot of the console game uh, started to add different um different services and different apps now one of those services was social media now this created a conundrum for a lot of these women because immediately their private space you know this private gaming space that they once you know kept like sacred was going to be made visible so um um do i have the oh i don't have that that page i wanted to create um well in the app you can and say you want to link your link your xbox account to your social media so whenever you link that that account uh um, aspects of your digital gaming identity is emitted and known into the space. So let's say if I if I share right now, you know, if, if, if I do something in the game and then I share it to Twitter, then people can get um, get a sense of like who, what my gaming persona is, my gamer identity, um, and all those kinds of things. And so that, um, so a lot of black women in particular don't use those features because they really want to keep those spaces private. And as one woman, you know, uh, she had, she remarked, she said gaming is really like the place where I can go like to get private privacy still because everybody is, this is a quote, everybody and their mama is on Facebook, you know, so she doesn't utilize Facebook like in a, in a way um, um, that, that a lot of us do, you know, just posting all kinds of things, you know, she wants to keep some aspects of her life um, very private. Um, how am I for time? Am I okay for time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Five okay. more minutes. Oh, okay. Perfect. 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 Let me get back to this slide here. Let's see. Close that out. I lost the screen. I lost where I was at. My apologies. Okay. I'm going to just read just a little bit more just to, um, 
Okay, so in returning to that narrative of Black women attending the Say Her Name March, it is necessary to highlight the technologies that supported their mobilization. Their tech use and where they engage created methodological conundrums for me as a researcher. And I had just like explained, you know, do I capture this stuff? Do I, do I, um, do I preserve this stuff? You know, am I able to like use this stuff? So that was like one of the conversations that I did have for them. You know, when I, when I asked, I was like, is this something that I can preserve and I can save? And they said, like for me, they said, well, Kishana, ain't nobody um uh nobody people probably could care less about what you're writing you know their concern was like in the social media space so they said go ahead and write whatever you need for your book and it's a really supportive like community a lot of them are older women who have been like gaming since like the atari and nintendo days and have transitioned into like digital gaming a lot of them are younger space so it's a really interesting like dynamic but and a lot of them you know have have a, levels of like education they have graduate degrees you know they have um, bachelor degrees and so they are aware about like how the low visibility the academics have you know so they said go ahead Kishana you can use this stuff but I still I never would screen capture you know like their their stories because I still I wanted to protect that sacred space that they had imagined for themselves and also created for themselves so I would always just summarize but I've never you know to this day and I still won't um you know, I might capture you know the Instagram the things that they put on their public pages um but I think you know for me like ethically you know there's this like that's the challenge like for stories um I still have not and I will not uh, capture um, any, any of those things there. Um, so I explore Black women's engagement with ephemeral digital technology as unsettling space. Um, and a lot of this really like bucks up against, you know, academics' desire to preserve culture. But then I ask the question, are we actually like losing culture? Am I missing out on something by not per preserving, you know, these, these digital artifacts, you know, that they have put out into the world? But I frame it in a way that Paul Giroy states, in the history of the Black Atlantic, movement, relocation, displacement, and restlessness are the norms rather than the exceptions. By Giroy's theory from the Black Atlantic, I similarly consider restlessness of Black praxis within the digital gaming, with, within digital gaming, exploring these cultures as hybrid and ephemeral and translocational. And as Floya Antheus argues, in applying an intersectional lens to translocational positionality, the world transnational su su suggests social, symbolic, and material ties between homelands and that are centered in two or more national spaces. Now I apply that, you know, to try to make sense of like women who move in and out of like digital and then the different types of uh, digital and then gaming spaces and actually physical spaces, you know, from the home, you know, going out to the, to the courthouse and going downtown to protest um, and going into the streets and, you know, participating in like the uprisings and rebellions, you know, so that's how I make, um, I'm applying like this notion of like uh, transnational, like to, to those kinds of movements as opposed to like to the more traditional um, kind of uh, usage of the word. So the intersectional transmediated practice in which women engage in gaming communities reflect the ways that they create meaning out of different texts and experiences, cultures and practices, and they bridge multiple to create a hybrid summation of experience based on the context of the space. Black folks have patched and pieced together multiple modes of culture and identity due to the discontinuous trajectory of the Black Atlantic, a practice that resonates significantly with the digital experience of the Black diaspora. And applying this concept to the fragmented experiences of Black gamers online, I am able to continue making the connections between the visual and physical arrangements of racial and gendered hierarchies and physical relations to go beyond the discursive practices that render and regulate certain bodies to the margins. And I'll, I'll stop there that we can make sure to have enough space. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so the, our next feature, speaker is uh, Professor Jane Rhodes and her presentation is Blackness in the Archive, the Promise and Peril of Media Texts. Hello everybody, good morning. Thank you Kishona, that was a wonderful talk. I always learn so much. I'm actually gonna use technology here and uh, time myself. Um, also, because uh, I want to make sure that we have time for everyone. Um, so today, my um, comments, uh, it's not a fully formed paper, um, are sort of ruminations about the, these questions about preservation and ephemerality. And I think I'm um, in line very much with the conversation on Black women's lives. Um, and that's uh, the standpoint from which I'm going to talk about. Uh, I was incredibly inspired by Dr. Fuente's brilliant talk yesterday, so I, I wanted to mention that first and very much moved by her um, alerting us to the archive's ability to obscure and deny racial violence, to re-narrate experience, and to uphold whiteness. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge my panelist, Deborah Gray White, who is really the first scholar 30 some years ago to um, alert us 
to the invisibility of black women in the archive and has uh, influenced my work and, and many others. Um, so this morning, I just wanted to pursue a little bit and pick up on Dr. Fuente's comments um, about um, archives and, and violence to black bodies um, through a project I'm waiting in the middle of, um, along with my collaborator. Um, I'm interested in how the archive leaves and renders black subjects invisible. And this story is about the agency of a black woman who seeks to curate her story um, and how she tried to appropriate sites that might retain her memory and give evidence that she mattered. Um, and I think this is really sort of a critical issue for um, th those who are invisible. Um, as we know, archives are structured by their creator as well as those who create, curate and organize the material and of course the interpretation. Um, and we've been hearing a lot of discussion about that. And this has been exceedingly clear in our analysis in this project. Um, and I think that the, all of these sort of multiple um, intersections are, are really crucial for our discussion today. So I wanted to start off just with this quote um, to sort of um, mark um, the, this entire conference in many ways, but also um, the kinds of questions that we're thinking about. Um, the, the, that the archive uh, is, is so fragile um, that it doesn't represent truth, um, that it's a repository, uh, but it depends so much on us, on the living to animate. So the person that I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit today is uh, Marie Battle Singer. Um, and she's the subject of a project um, that I'm collaborating on with Lynn Hudson of the History Department at UIC. Uh, the title of our project is Transatlantic Blackness in the Era of Jim Crow, the Life of Marie Battle Singer. And there she is. Um, born in 1910 at the sort of the epicenter of the Jim Crow era. Um, she died in 1985. And uh, a critical element of this story is that Marie Battle Singer was also my aunt, my mother's sister. Um, and so that plays a significant component in this project. Um, I can't really spend a lot of time going over all the details of her life. But she was an expatriate, perhaps an expatriate twice. Um, first, during the Great Migration, leaving the Deep South to the North, and then a second um, flight to England um, in the late 1940s. She trained uh, with Anna Freud uh, to become a psychoanalyst um, and is considered the first Black psychoanalyst in Britain. She was an artist. She was a teacher. She was an activist. And um, as you'll see in a few, few moments, she was also a writer. Um, she was the part of her, the critical nature of her story and one that I think is particularly relevant to how we think about black bodies and, and trauma is that she was born in Mississippi. Um, this is a photograph of her um, as a young woman. And this is her family, my family. Um, and uh, here she is, the um, third eldest in the family. Um, and I'll just highlight the, young, the youngest is my mother. Um, and they were uh, a family of educators in the Deep South, uh, a small town called Oklahoma, Mississippi, where my grandfather um, started a, a college at, for Black youth and um, faced incredible opposition and violence really on a daily basis. Um, and so much of her memory, um, of Marie's memory and the family memory is about trauma, is about racial trauma. And while you know this is a symbolic image of the Ku Klux Klan, it's also a material reality of the family. Um, the, uh, a school teacher was murdered by the Klan, they were harassed. Um, uh, relentlessly by the Klan and others in this community, and they eventually fled to the North um, to escape racial violence. So this marked Marie Singer and had a profound influence on, uh, on her life. 
Now, let me just get rid of the annotation. Um, Let's see if we can advance the slide. Uh -oh, have I have comment. a comment in the chat. If you could speak a little bit louder because it's okay. uh, soft. Yes. Okay. I will do that. So let's see. Uh, there we go. Uh, is that a little bit better? People can say in the chat if I'm not speaking quite loudly enough. So we get to the archive. She dies in 1985 in Britain. Um, and um, I <clears throat> assemble the archive along with Professor Hudson. Um, and uh, to even sort of thinking about the archive, who owns it and um, who manages it is a sort of critical question. Obviously, her hand is the most important one in the archive. She kept um, every scrap of personal material, of records, of memorabilia, um, and um, packaged that and left it for the next generation. Then there's the process of inheritance. Um, and uh, it's the classic story of the dusty attic and the moldy basement um, from which we begin to assemble these materials. The archive is also memory, um, very much a, a significant part of um, what there is to learn and understand about her resides in the memory of family, friends, colleagues, patients, um, and lots of people who had a, a distant relationship with her. There's, of course, the official record, um, thinking about the, the role of the state in marking her. Um, and, you know, that is, becomes a sort of critical question um, that, that Dr. Fuentes raised yesterday and others have talked about um, and, and certainly critical for Black women's history um, and whether or not they actually appear in the record um, and what about them appears. And then finally, as in the, I, I did hint this in the title of the talk, um, the role of the media. Um, does, do people appear in media texts and who has control over that appearance? And that these are just some images from the archive um, in our home. The books are sitting right behind me. So thinking about um, the silences in the archive, these are just a few documents that uh, represent the actual um, sort of official archive. Uh, the, all of the kind of typical things that a historian excavates. Um, we found a passenger manifest of her travels, uh, a marriage certificate, um, and her death certificate. And you know, one of the things that I think is really um, critical about this is that you know, the state follows you. Uh, the state um, sort of both narrates your life, but also decides what parts of your life are going to be um, sort of articulated or rendered silent. And in a cruel twist, the thing that she's rarely marked of is as a race subject. You know, her blackness doesn't appear. It rarely appears in these records except um, for census reports. So we know she's female, we know she travels, we know she marries, but really who is she? Um, why is she here? Why has she taken uh, this route, this trajectory? Um, and um, how do we find out more um, in this journey? So one of the ways that we've try to think about this and, and imagine this is through her ambition to write. Um, in addition to all of her other accomplishments, um, she really wanted to contribute to the media. Um, and, and we really see this as, as an ambition, not only to be heard, but to be remembered, you know, right? to, to, to leave a stamp. Um, and this is a photograph of her, uh, perhaps taken in uh, in the mid-1960s and 1964. Of course, we know that the, the time and date stamp on a photo doesn't necessarily mean that's when the photo was taken, um, but when it was printed. And, you know, we can read lots into this photograph, her confidence and her bearing, her beauty, her age. Um, but if you look closely down in the lower portion of the image, you also see this um, carrying case with a handle. And that is her portable typewriter. And I always think that it's quite fascinating to see that um, uh, paired with her because I think it represents a great deal about her um, ambition and desire to write and the ways in which writing 
along with all of her other um, sort of uh, activities, um, really uh, accompanied her wherever she went. And the other things that we see in this slide are uh, representations of much of her public writing. She was um, successful. She uh, worked feverishly to accomplish this goal. She had a series in the Sunday Observer um, of London that was syndicated uh, globally on uh, adolescent psychology. She wrote numerous essays and commentary in literary journals and magazines. Um, she even um, had broadcasts on the BBC and in other media outlets. So we might think that uh, she uh, was able to enact her ambition, that her ambition actually came to life and was realized. Um, these texts are from her archive. And one of the things, uh, let me just go back for a moment, because I think one of the things about these texts um, that um, archivists and, and, and scholars and writers and people looking at an archive might notice are how they were saved. They were lovingly saved, but they're fragmented, they're folded, they're yellowed, they're stained, they're marked in different ways, which tells us something about her life. It tells us that she, they meant a lot to her, that they mattered, um, that she wanted to retain these in some way, um, perhaps to pass them on to others. They are also sort of tossed around and disaggregated um, in the, the packaging and in the um, moving. Um, they tell us so much. These are not the sanitized, digitized media archive that's often without context or without identification. She wanted recognition, but she was also rendered invisible, um, in part because no reader knows who she is. Um, you can see in at least the one in the middle that she used, doesn't use her full married name. Um, and of course, in print media, no one is going to see her face, right? So no one knows her identity. Um, and perhaps she wanted it that way. So, there are at least one moment when she does talk about race. Um, and that is in an essay that she wrote called The Giant in the Dark, which was published in 1958. And um, she published the solitary essay in a highbrow literary journal uh, on the psychoanalytic underpinnings of race riots. Um, this is the, in the midst of the Notting Hill race riots. It's part of the cacophony of racial tumult that's going on in Britain at this time. Um, and she's raging um, about blackness um, in the midst of black rays. Um, this is the period when uh, James Baldwin's essays are bursting onto the scene, um, another immigrant. Um, and so um, we see her attempting to sort of weigh in on this conversation to provide an argument. One of the things, here's some quotes from this essay. One other, she says, is that the Negro can easily be identified with the giant in the room who's doing dirty things to mummy. Um, she's evoking the concept of transference and penis envy um, to uh, describe and explain the hatred and violence aimed at black men. So this was an incredibly provocative condemnation of whiteness, yet no one knows that the writer is black. Um, and so we have to ask, does that matter? Um, does she matter? And does she have uh, a legacy to recognize? And I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap up here. Um, one of the things that I think is critically important about um, her legacy as a, a writer and as a thinker and as a black woman who did a great deal, but has not been um, sort of visible or recognized, is that there's this sort of lingering loneliness in her archive. Um, we found a folder of writings about race that she labeled Negroes. Um, and um, there, some of them are sort of distant and analytical, some are deeply personal and tinged with bitterness and anger, um, but they were never published. Um, were they rejected? Did she try? Did she give up? Were they for her eyes only? Hence, um, the, the ephemerality and the failure of the media archive. Um, if one was to seek out those spaces uh, to understand more about her life, um, that would be a failure. So 
I'm going to stop there um, and uh, be happy to talk about this um, project more to answer questions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rhodes. Um, we'll now move on to our third presentation, Aren't I a Woman? and the Changing Historical Archive from Deborah Gray White. I didn't know what, in fact, I was really going to talk about today. Um, Mark said that I could talk about anything I wanted to. <laughs> and so that's what I've decided to do. Um, and um, I, I speak today as one who, uh, actually I have four things that I really want to, to uh, point out. Um, because I speak as one who first has survived the archive. In fact, in some ways defied it and just barely got away with doing that. Um, and second, I speak as someone who has been frustrated by the archive. Uh, and third, as one who is writing a personal history and in doing so and in, in doing research on myself can also speak to the limits of the archive. And then fourth, as one who is creating an archive myself, um, my papers will be housed at the Radcliffe Schlesinger Library at Harvard. And dare I say that um, my ideas and opinions on archives um, changes depending on my positionality. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about. And I intend to speak very briefly uh, from these about these four positions that, that I come to the archives with. First, let me talk briefly about surviving and defying the archive. Uh, many of you know this story, but bear with me since um, I think it deserves retelling so that young scholars in the audience know the perils and how very real they are. So I received my PhD from UIC in 1979. Uh, my dissertation, which was the earliest rendition of Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South, was rejected in 1978 when I was supposed to graduate because it was alleged that I had not done enough research in the plantation records and diaries and letters the traditional sources of slavery. I had relied heavily on the WPA oral history narratives. And although I lamented that I couldn't find enslaved women in the traditional sources, uh, my lament was dismissed. I was chastised for being lazy. And of course, the paucity of plantation records in my sources was offered as proof that I just really either didn't know how to do research or that I hadn't done enough. And in fact, um, my uh, members of my committee, in particular, one member pointed to Eugene Genovese and Herbert Gubman and said, look at the plantation records they use. How come you can't find anything, but they can, they can, they can write huge books on this. In any case, in retrospect, the criticism puts me in mind of enslaved women who, after working from dawn to dusk, were described as lazy. In reality, I was being told that by relying so heavily on the WPA narratives, the Black sources, I was taking the easy way out, that I was shirking the hard work presented by the traditional white sources. The fact that I had spent over a year and more in the plantation records and other quote unquote traditional sources, and that it was like getting blood from a stone really didn't matter. Encoded in that criticism was a very piercing message. Uh, enslaved women had been invisible in the historical record and I was told that to make them visible, I would have to abide by the dictates of a profession that prioritized the words and feelings of those who had rendered them invisible in the first place. I was being told that enslaved women's voices 
as they came through the WPA narratives would not be heard unless they were filtered through white and black male authored Steve's. I was being told that people like my great grandmother did not have a history worth telling, that their version of slavery was not objective, and that their memories were less sacrosanct than those of their owners and their descendants. Also, my objectivity was suspect because I was a Black woman doing Black women's history. And all underneath all of the critiques of the innumerable problems that existed with the WPA narratives, as if they were the only sources of slavery that presented problems, was the message that I was just a lousy historian. I think I have proved them wrong, but I know this to be a cautionary tale because even when they exist, black sources are not given the same weight as white sources. They are always considered suspect and or non-objective. As well, research, researching and writing history while black is still fraught with remarkable hurdles. In any case, let me move to my second point, my sense of the archive as a historian who has been frustrated by it. So after my experience with Aren't I a Woman, I ran from the 19th century. I just, I got the hell out of there uh, for the most part. The material, of course, uh, on enslaved women was devastating and that was reason enough to run. But really, I wanted to prove that I was a good historian and that I could work with sources if I had some. Give me an archive, I thought. I'll show you. <laughs> uh, that's when I started working on Too Heavy a Load. Well, enter the culture of the semblance. Or as Darlene Clark Hine puts it, the behavior and attitudes of Black women, this is a quote, that created the appearance of openness and disclosure, but actually shielded the truth of their inner lives and selves from their oppressors. Throughout the 20th century, you see, Black women knew, and they still know, that history and historians often function to oppress them. And so does the archive. That's why they hid themselves, not just from their contemporary, but, but from historians. And I could write volumes on this, and I, I have written uh, pieces of it in various places. But suffice it to say that one need only look uh, at several of Mary Church Terrell's diaries, for example. Terrell, uh, for those of you who don't know, was a, a Black activist whom, um, whose activism spanned the late 19th and a good part of the 20th century. What you find in her diaries is that she redacts the private parts of her life. She wrote them down, but then when she realized, of course, that she was going to be putting them in an archive and that they were going to be preserved, she went through them with a black magic marker. So we have her comings and goings and her service to the race. Um, but when it comes to her private thoughts, nothing, very little. I could say more, uh, and I could say a lot about that. Um, but I want to move on to my third position in, in confronting the archive um, as one who's writing a personal history. And here I confront the difference between the archive and memory. Where does one in and the other begin? So I grew up on the west side of Manhattan in a neighborhood that's Manhattan, New York city many of us from new york don't think we have to say anything about it. just say new york west side that's it manhattan but uh it's now known as the upper west side so i grew up on 61st street and amsterdam avenue before it was the upper west side the part i grew up in was called san juan kill it was transi transitioning to 
the posh Lincoln Center of New York. Uh, uh, but the first rendition of that urban renewal project, uh, the urban renewal project that gave birth to Lincoln Center was the Amsterdam Projects, a public housing development that still exists right behind the Metropolitan Opera House. So last year, I began archival research on this housing project and the difference between what I remembered of my life there and what the records held was like night and day. The archive bore no resemblance to my memories. Obviously, the black and white tables, the figures, the letters uh, could fill pages of a sociological review, but my technicolor memories <laughs> clearly didn't jive with those of the housing authority. And I'll just give, give one example, and, and that's about the elevators. So I paid particular attention to sources documenting the elevators because in my memory, one could only survive the high-rise projects if one survived the elevators. Failure to absorb what I call the politics of the elevator uh, could lead to disaster. Um, the archive documents the elevators in a very straightforward way. How much was spent, who got what contract, the maintenance and the janitorial schedules. My remembrances, on the other hand, as, as someone who lived on the top floor of a 13-story high-rise was full of colors that were predominantly red and yellow. You know, the red for all the blood that one could see in the elevator and the yellow for the urine that was there. And they were also smell, filled with the smells that went along uh, with the blood and, and the piss. The housing authority tells you that they put a whole lot of money into the elevators. My remembrances say that it was never enough. The difference between the surviving sources in my memories can, of course, be reconciled and, you know, I'm working with it in my mind. But I wonder how so many others confront this archive, those who don't have my memories. Um, it's the stuff of morning and reports to come. To my final position as one who is creating an archive. A few years ago, the Radcliffe Schlesinger Library at Harvard asked me to donate my papers. They invited me to Cambridge and I met with the black female archivist who would be handling my papers. I signed the requisite legal papers. They sent me boxes with prepaid FedEx postage and I started filling them. I was so proud, I really was and, and still am, little Debbie Gray, that's what, what everybody knew me in the projects at. Uh, I would be remembered. I put files and memories and documents about myself into the boxes, but for some reason I could not and still have not mailed them. I find myself going back and forth to them, taking stuff out and putting stuff back in. Um, at first, I told myself that, you know, um, I'm not going to mail these because really, I'm writing this history about myself and um, I would probably need some of these documents just to jog my memory, you know. But then I realized that there was something much deeper going on and <laughs> I have many times cursed myself for cursing Mary Church Durrell and her redacted uh, documents because I really didn't understand the dilemma that confronted her when she decided to let other people into her life and perhaps see the real her. Did I want people to read my diaries? More importantly, what responsibility do I have to my children and my grandchildren? Even though I had signed the legal documents limiting access to certain subjects and areas of my life, I wondered about my responsibility to those I hold most dear. As a historian writing my own history and as a historian leaving an archive, 
I wonder about the ethics of exposure. So this is my sense of the archive. Throughout my life as a scholar, I've confronted it from these different positions. And I thank you for inviting me and for forcing me once again to probe these very important subjects. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the panelists. And so we're gonna move on to some questions um, in the chat. So just a reminder, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat rather than the Q&A. And also, if you, um, if you send it to just the panelists, I'll keep your name private. Um, if you send it to all the panelists and attendees, I'll, I'll read the person's name. Um, so we had a question um, from a, a little bit earlier. Is the silences of Mary Church Terrell because of her role as a club woman and perhaps the need for privacy and protection as a black woman? I think that it's because, um, it, I don't think it's just because she's a club woman. I think it's because she is, um, she's, she's aware as a black woman that, um, that her, her thoughts and feelings can be used against her. And I don't know that, uh, you know, um, I, know, I don't think we can single her out just because she's a club woman, she does this. In fact, um, reading more carefully and given the, the new research has been, that's, that is being done. I mean, we have singled out club women as a particular kind of woman. And yet um, club women were working class women. They were, um, they were elite women, they were middle-class, you know, in terms of what that meant for the turn of the century. So actually what I understood as I was putting, I'm not a club woman, I'm not an activist. I just think that everybody, anyone has to ask themselves, you know, I mean, I wanted to know more about her personal life. I wanted to know about her inner feelings. I wanted to know, for example, you know, why she and Mary McLeod Bethune didn't get along. Um, and I wanted to see in her diaries whether or not she actually had something to say about that. But she wanted to keep that to herself. And that was, her, and my feeling is that it's her right to do that. She didn't have to share what she felt about herself or um, her relationships with um, her generation or the next generation or the generation after that. And I think that that uh, combined with the culture of assemblance on top of the culture of assemblance is what has to give us pause. But I think it's going to give anyone pause, anyone who has the ability to leave their diaries. You know, um, anyone who's putting their quote unquote house in order as they get older has to say to themselves, okay, do I really, you know, who do I want to be able to see this? And I think that she was doing that and decided, okay, I'll let you see some of this, but other parts I'm not gonna let you see. And as I said, when I first started with um, Too Heavy a Load, um, I didn't quite understand that. And I did think it was because she's a club woman and she's an elite woman. She wants some uh, people to think of her a particular way. But quite frankly, what I think the issue is, is that she was just a person, a human being who is concerned about, you know, well, what's gonna happen when, when my children see this? Or what's gonna happen when my children's children see this? Or what's gonna happen when the next generations and generations, you know, um, she can't control that. And as much as we like to control our everyday lives, in the, and once we're gone, we can't control that. And that's something that really makes you think when you know that, okay, this is gonna be preserved for posterity. Thank you. And Jane, I don't know if you'd wanna comment on that as well, because it seemed like Marie Battle uh, also had that in mind when she was curating her, or saving her documents that, um, there were certain things that she didn't want to make public. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think Deborah is absolutely right that, you know, sometimes this is the only way Black women can control the narrative about their lives. This is the only way that Black women can shape um, history um, and, and shape the ways in which they're remembered and seen. Um, I think one of the things about Marie Battle Singer that we're still figuring out is that she was being strategic. She wanted some 
parts of the story to be told and other parts not. Um, and that's what we very much find in the archive, um, that she um, sort of looked across her history as she's collecting material and paper. And there are certain things that she, she's intending to be remembered. So, you know, I think that's the other thing that we have to remember is that, you know, the sort of subaltern um, does have control, right? It does have control over history um, and is incredibly conscious, as Professor White says, about the ways in which um, their work is going to be read. I, if I could also add to that, I think that that is, that is the way I think even white men put their material into the archive. They want people to believe a particular thing about them. So when you go to the archives of uh, great men, they're not going to talk about how they raped Sally yesterday morning or whatnot. They're going to present themselves in, uh, you know, with all of the honor and with all of the mastery uh, that a Southern patriarch would, one would expect. They're not going to uh, uh, say, okay, you know, look at Jefferson. <laughs> You're not going to talk about uh, Sally Hemings. Okay, so, and we have to read between the lines. So I just think that all archives are created that way uh, with a political point of view in mind. And um, Black women uh, are no different. Okay, so um, I'll just mention that Kishana had to step away, um, but she did have a question here uh, that her kids want to know. Why people don't listen to Black women, I'll add, and did they listen to Black women more back in the day? Does the digital amplifier voices more or is there too much happening now? How has access to us changed over time? And for Jane and Deborah, how differently does the archive look when we curate slash preserve ourselves? <laughs> well, for that last part, I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, I am figuring it out. I look to my left or whatever is maybe it's your right, uh, and I I can see the boxes still sitting there. So I'm you know, and I mean I'm I'm still thinking about that. So I can't really answer. Oh, I mean I I yeah, it's in flux. Um, it, I think that's an interesting question about whether the digital world amplifies it more. Um, um, gives us more access to black women's voices and other sort of underrepresented voices. Obviously it does, but I think part of it is exactly what Kishona was studying and talking about, which is the ways in which black women um, have appropriated those tools, right? So they've claimed those tools, they've claimed those spaces um, precisely so they can have conversations, but they can also sort of narrate and structure. Uh, their world and and what people know about them and the ways in which they you know sort of mediate that they control what gets public and what doesn't get public is all about um, sort of black women's agency. So um, you know I think it's quite different now than it was um, you know in the 19th century or the early 20th century or even the late 20th century. Um, but it doesn't mean you know, I mean, it's also, there's always a back and forth, right? There's a backlash, there's resistance. So she also shows us um, the ways in which um, even in the digital world, or perhaps particularly the digital world, uh, the archive uh, gets, um, you know, distorted and battered and controlled. Um, black women are harassed in those spaces also. Uh, so, you know, the danger lurks everywhere. Mm. Um, I mean, I would also add um, the, the, the last book I wrote, which was uh, Lost in the USA, uh, was uh, helped tremendously by, um, by the digital, mainly because uh, I was able to access, for example, when I looked at the Million Woman March, I was able to access every single article in the country that had been written by 
uh, about, about that Million Women March. And what I did was to go through them and, and lift comments that had been made to reporters. Now, and that was whether or not it was like a campus, um, a, a campus newspaper or even a small town newspaper. I mean, it, it created an incredible amount of work because when you start looking at that football field and you start to think about, you know, how many articles were written on the Million Woman March. And I also did it for the Million Man March and all of the other marches of the 1990s. And every single time I came, I read them and every single time I came across, well, you know, they had interviewed a black woman and it was, it was clear to me that this was a black woman or um, a black reporter. Um, I could actually say, okay, I'm getting the point of view of a black woman here, and she's actually speaking on it. But it took it, it took just goo gobs and goo gobs and goo gobs of time because there is a football field full of knowledge now if you want to go through it. Um, so I do think it makes it a lot more difficult for the 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 researcher. Okay, so I have um, another question here. Um, um, Dr. White, what advice would you give to other black women currently in graduate school navigating ac academic spaces as black women while also researching the lives of black women? <laughs> Do you want me to say it? Uh, um, well, I mean, I, 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 could, uh, I could teach a course on it, right? Um, I would say a couple of things. I would say, number one, um, don't take everything personally because a lot of it is, uh, is, is political and you just happen to be black and female in a political world where you, know, uh, you were not dealt a whole lot of trump cards. But, and it's, it's not personal. I took a lot of things personally and um, I realized too that I needed to really learn how to um, how to wait, unfortunately, but how to wait so that certain things could in fact be revealed. I would say to persevere um, and I would say to write that if you're in a, if you're in a program, um, particularly if you're in the humanities or the social sciences, before you do anything, you are a researcher and more importantly, a writer before you are a sociologist or a historian or a humanist, whatever. But that is what you need to focus on for the first 10 years of your career. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one more question and I, uh, I see Stacy you've answered this in the chat already, already but um, this, this question's for you. Uh, your visualization of the footprint of digital archives is very powerful. Are there creative green archiving practices you know of and can you share? Um, yes, yes, so thank you. What I, what I was saying in the chat was that I think collection development policies go a really, really long way. Um, it, I do feel like in libraries and archives, yes, we have them, but oftentimes I, you know, by the time we've come into the institution, perhaps that policy was written a really long time ago uh, by someone who hadn't worked there in many, many years. So uh, if you're talking about the institution, I think being sure to actually revisit the collection development policy maybe every five years instead of uh, things change more frequently uh, during that period of time. Uh, but then also, it, so if you're talking more granular and it's like a specific project, a research type of project, uh, really bringing the researcher into those, bringing the researcher into those decisions. So I'll ask during an initial uh, consultation, how long do you want the website to live for? And for most, uh, for most faculty or most researchers, it's a surprise for them to even be asked because they realized their assumption was that it was, it was probably going to live just forever without any other intervention, but making very clear to them, no, 
you have a responsibility to help determine and make this decision and then actually think about the resources that are being used. Um, there's, there's no magic here. That's, <laughs> I guess that's really, uh, yeah, no, no magic here. It's all labor and it's all work and somebody has to do it. So those are, those are ways I think that you can help bring people into that combo. Thank you so much to all the panelists. I will be thinking about your presentations for a long time to come. So that was from another um, a panelist from yesterday. So everyone, thank you so much for another exciting and interesting conversation this morning. I appreciate all of the panelists agreeing to participate in the conference. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Fantastic panel. Okay, to those returning, welcome back. I hope you all are nice and refreshed. My colleague, Professor Mark Canuel, will now take over to introduce Roderick Ferguson, our keynote speaker for this morning. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce Roderick Ferguson. This is Actually, the second time that I've had the pleasure of introducing Rod in the past few years um, since he was actually here at UIC um, at the Institute for the Humanities for a fellowship um, just a while back. And while I very much miss having him as a colleague at UIC um, and as a friend just to pop down the street for a uh, a quick dinner um, as we were wont to do. I'm so grateful that he's here to join us for this conference. Um, professor Ferguson is professor in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Program uh, at Yale, and he taught at the University of Minnesota and at Princeton before joining the faculty at UIC, where he taught from 2014 to 2019. With his BA from Howard and his PhD from UC San Diego in sociology, Ferguson has produced groundbreaking work that has been interdisciplinary and adventurously theoretical while always aiming at interventions that really matter in our everyday practices. His work has engaged the ways in which power dynamics are multiply determined by race, class, gender and sexuality, and his impulse in approaching political and cultural theorists from Marx and Althusser to Foucault and Ranciere has not really been to discount their insights, but to redirect their analyses by accounting for their blind spots and disavowals in any attempt to argue that power emerges from unitary sources with overgeneralized solutions normative political theorizing about the family, class, and social progress, Ferguson argues, need to take account of the more contentiously embodied features of social life that cut across numerous axes of racial and sexual difference. It's never enough to talk about mere intersections among these categories, but to talk about their ever-changing patterns of dominance and collusion. He's worked out a series of really consequential arguments in four single authored books, Aberrations in Black, Toward a Queer of Color Critique, The Reorder of Things, The University and Its Pedagogies of Minority Difference, We Demand, The University and Student Protests, and this um, latter book, um, I. Um, would just flag that it's really stunning in its theoretical way of um, approaching the public sphere while also speaking directly to students in their protest movements. And I think that it's kind of emblematic of um, Rod's work that it is theoretical, but also has this really practical significance to it. One Dimensional que uh, Queer um, is, from 2018, and it traces out serious costs of normalizing queer identity and queer politics in a way that suppresses the more multi-layered queer activism reminiscent from the 1960s, with its far more inclusive agencies across race, class, and gender. And he has co-edited two indispensable volumes, Strange Affinities, The Gender and Sexual Politics, of comparative racialization 
and more, most recently, Keywords in African American Studies, published in 2018 with NYU Press. In addition to these, his 40 articles and reviews have ranged over the issues of gender, sexuality, race, class, justice, and power, particularly in terms of the way that they inflect our social and institutional structures in the United States. And in over 50 talks um, in the last five years alone, Ferguson has been speaking on radical queer politics, the Black diaspora, and many issues pertaining to faculty and pedagogy in the university. His honors and awards include a Princeton University Old Dominion Fellowship, a University of California Humanities Research Institute Fellowship, and the Crompton Knoll Award from the Modern Language Association for his essay, on the Parvenu Baldwin and the Other Side of Redemption. That's in a volume on James Baldwin, um, published uh, by um, or edited by Dwight McBride, also a UIC connection. Please joining, join me in welcoming, um, giving him a warm virtual welcome um, to speak to us today on the sonic life of the bookshop of Black queer diaspora. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I wish we were all together, um, but it's wonderful to see the tiles with familiar faces and names in it. Uh, I'm just going to go into the talk itself. All right, so this is uh, part of a um, book project I've been working on for a while, a conceptual book project that uh, tries to address um, Black queer activism and art in the 70s, 80s, and a bit of the 90s, um, art and activism, I should say, and the way in which they critique neoliberal formations in the US, the UK, and Canada, but it does so through a um, series of fictional visits to a fictional Black queer bookshop and gallery. In the beginning, there were the sounds and noises of the neighborhood, cars warming up for weekend errands, city buses screeching to pick up passengers, car horns honking impatiently, security shutters being rolled up by business owners, and the laughter of children thankful for the weekend. On this Saturday, the bookshop has extended its hours to conduct its first ever sound session throughout the store. Believing that they have perhaps emphasized its visual and literary inventory to the detriment of the bookshop's aural holdings, the proprietors have gone through the attic, basement, and all the closets, pulling out the various LPs, 45s, 8-tracks, cassettes, CDs, turntables, stereo players, boom boxes, and CD players that had been tucked away for some undefined later use. Knowing that sound also lives in images, the proprietors have gathered old v VHS tapes and DVDs as well. On this day, the bookshop will explore and present the aural universe that lives inside and behind its visual, sonic, and textual archives. Chairs have been placed in the central room for those who wish to sit down and listen to whatever sounds come through. In that main room, speakers have been located near the bookshelves so that people can browse the books as they take the sounds in. There, in the main room, a TV is playing a scene from Isaac Julian's 1991 film, Young Soul Rebels. The film dramatizes the complex social relations that were bearing down on Britain in 1977, the developing neoconservatism and fascism that was taking, that was overtaking political and social life, as well as the social diversity that was building in confidence. The film is centered on a friendship between two Black men, Chris and Kaz, who make up the underground DJ duo Soul Patrol. Theirs is a camaraderie across sexuality, as Chris is straight and Kaz is queer. In the room, a handful of people are sitting in the chairs in front of the TV. The first sound the listeners hear is a song by the British punk rock singer, Polly Styrene. The scene depicts an underground club 
located in the crypt of a church. Chris and Kaz are setting up to DJ. The song they play is I Like It from the jazz-inspired disco and funk band, The Players Association. And this is Cass. Soul, Soul Patrol. Patrol. You like it? I like it. Players Association. song comes from the Players Association self-titled album and was a favorite among underground club DJs in the US and the UK. It dramatizes Paul Gilroy's observation in There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack that, quote, Black Britain prized records as the primary source for its emergent culture and the discs were overwhelmingly imported or licensed from abroad, end quote. The mix of jazz, disco, and funk stands as a metaphor for the social mixing taking place in London at the time. Upon hearing the band sing the refrain, I like it, the listeners have a sense that what is liked is the heterogeneity that the club has managed to produce. Discussing what it means to like something, the theorist Jonathan Flatley states, quote, Liking is less a discrete emotion than an elemental attraction, the most basic positive feeling one can have, a readiness to pay attention to something and be affected by it. As such, it is also an implicit affirmation of something's existence." End quote. The listeners know that in selecting this scene, the bookshop is affirming the existence of all those who bide their time on the margins. One of the texts that the owners like is a copy of Julian's Diary of a Young Soul Rebel, his 1991 book about the film. This book is open and placed in the display case, talking about the club cultures that proliferated London during the film's period. The page reads, quote, in 1977, the consumer development, which currently produces endlessly demarcated spaces, black clubs, gay clubs, etc., wasn't so well established, end quote. It was in that moment that underground clubs like The Lacey Lady and Global Village would yield wonderfully hybrid spaces, black, white, gay, straight, like the one depicted on the TV screen. For Julian, the clubs represented an effort to reinvent social space, a reinvention in which music was more than just entertainment. As he says, quote, the reinvention started around the music, opening up a space for a whole number of transgressions, both racial and sexual, end quote. As the song mixes jazz, funk, and disco, it pays homage to an emerging modernity in which racial, gender, class, and sexual differences 
were inspirations for transgressing tired and taken for granted boundaries. In addition to the music itself, the scene contains the sound of dancing feet. That sound of feet scratching against the floor asserts itself and becomes an event above and beyond the music. Describing the eventful nature of sound, the writer and curator Caleb Kelly says, quote, a productive approach to sound making derives from the physical nature of sound, best described as sound as phenomena, end quote. The sound of the feet against the floor expresses the physical nature of the dancer's ecstasy. We might thus read the scene as a demonstration of the joy of heterogeneity, particularly in a moment of social and state repression. The clubs thus index the very necessary social and political function of joy and pleasure for minoritized and disfranchised communities, joy and pleasure trying to hold their ground as they talk to pain. Read as a political, theoretical exposition, the scene and the movie assert the necessity for producing the deliberate and regular conditions for joy and doing so in a world in which sound belongs to and offers up a philosophy of mixed bodies, bodies which are compound all the way through as the, as the philosopher Michael Saris said. In addition to a moment that witnessed the rise of London's racial and sexually diverse club scene, 1977 was also the year of the Battle of Lewisham, the event in which the fascist National Front attempted to march through the multiracial neighborhood of New Cross only to be headed off by a crowd of 10,000, a crowd made up of neighborhood residents as well as members of the Labor Party's young socialists and other activists. This is the period that would lead to what Stuart Hall describes as the reversals of the Thatcher administration, reversals in the areas of social thought and in the ideological domain, reversals that entailed stemming the tide of anti-capitalist and socialist sentiment from the 1960s and breaking what the Thatcher government referred to as, quote, the spell of the welfare state, end quote, a spell that presumably bound people in the UK to assume that the state could be relied upon for public support. It was also the moment in which populist and state forms of racism were directed at people of color in the name of law and order. There is a picture of the anti-fascist protesters prominently displayed in the room as well. It's a black and white photo depicting a multiracial crowd, many of them with their fists in the air and their mouths open in mid shout. The piece invokes an argument that the theorist W.J.T. Mitchell makes in his, art, in his article, There Are No Visual Media. He writes, quote, visual media is a colloquial expression used to designate things such as television, film, photography, and painting, etc. But it is highly inexact and misleading. On closer inspection, all this so-called visual media turn out to involve the other senses, especially touching and hearing. All media are from the standpoint of sensory modality, mixed media." End quote. On closer inspection, the photograph demands that we try to hear the sound of the protesters, the chants that they no doubt issued against fascism and racism, and the shouts that they surely uttered in the name of a freely heterogeneous neighborhood and society. In this way, the visual terrain of the photograph is mixed with an aural universe of insurrectionary sound and noise. The sound from an adjacent room is spilling into the main one. The sound is that of a song with the refrain, it's freedom time. The song is being played on a turntable that sits against the wall on the room's far end. Two speakers flank the turntable. Record covers have been hung behind it, making the wall into a sort of gallery. 
The song comes from one of the albums showcase. The cover is a collage made up of red, white, green, and black materials. The collage depicts a cottage, and in the back of it, a sun rises just above a mountain. <laughs> praying, no more crying. Look all around us, people are starving and dying. Dying for living, if you're willing, it's freedom time. Yeah, we've been given empty answers. The pain of oppression grows inside like a cancer. There's no savior, oh, in the struggle for freedom time. Some of the people in the room have started to dance while perusing the books on the shelves. Others have put down their books to dance more freely. All of them seem to be particularly animated by the line where the singer begins to shout, got to have my freedom, need my freedom now, ain't gonna let you hold me down. The song called Freedom Time is from the singer Linda Tillery's 1977 eponymous second album. Before embarking on a solo career, she was a member of the Berkeley-based R&B and psychedelic rock band, The Loading Zone which was formed in the mid to late 1960s. Tillery worked with artists such as Santana, Jessica Hagedorn, and Bobby McFerrin. We can situate the song partly within what the sound studies scholar Daphne Brooks refers to as the soundtrack of the black radical tradition. She states, quote, if there's a playbook for modern protest pop music, it is usually culled from the images and tropes captured, thank goodness, with indelible clarity in photographs taken more than half a century ago in the Deep South and all across the U.S. at lunch counters in churches, on college, on college campuses, and on picket lines as the second reconstruction unfolded. Such images conjure, conjure the sounds of secular and sacred music emanating from the masses, from the we shall not be moved, Sly and the Family Stone, everyday people who locked arm in arm and took to the streets as artists like the SNCC Freedom Singers, co-founded by Bernice Johnson Regan, and dashing celebrities like Harry and Lena and Eartha, shirt sleeves rolled up, sang a cappella at the top of their lungs, and led the revolution. Their voices were accompanied by the likes of Odetta, decked out in full length dashiki with guitar in hand, ominously warning us of those masters of war, and Nina Simone, high priestess of soul, delivering a, str a string of in your face sonic demands for equality, liberty, and full scale recognition of black humanity. These were sounds and images absolutely singular, yet simultaneously and fundamentally shaped and informed by the long arc of Black radical tradition, freedom, struggle, tactics." End quote. Tillery's Freedom Time emanates from that tradition with this concern about poverty and race. Tillery's work also arises from the feminist and queer social movements that were adjacent and perpendicular to the movements that Brooks engages. Indeed, we can hear an expansive definition of freedom in the song as well, an expansiveness that has to do with Tillery's investment in lesbian feminist politics and collectivities. 
she would become a singer, producer, and musician for the Olivia record label, a company started by the Washington DC collectives, the Furies and the radical lesbians. Tillery would go on to become one of the leading women's musicians of the time. Discussing women's music subcultures of the period, Jill Dolan argues, quote, the 70s were the heyday of subcultural women's music pioneers like Williamson, Holly Near, and Meg Christian, who could only sing about women loving women on small independent record labels that circulated through an economy so far underground, you had to be well established within it to know where to buy their albums, end quote. For Dolan, artists such as Tillery use their music to marry politics and affect. As she states, quote, women's music albums and performances were among the most audible, visible, powerful examples of emotion-fueled 1970s underground cultural production, end quote. Uniting politics and affect would produce lesbian feminist musical cultures that pushed the boundaries of what music could address. As Dolan continues, quote, women's music was pedagogical in the 1970s. In addition to building community through the fervent feeling inspired by its performers, the music itself delivered political meanings in a folk popular style that taught audiences the issues and guided us toward activism, end quote. That the sounds in the room are leaking into others is not a problem for the shop owners. In fact, it's what they intended. As they were planning the events for the sound session, they wanted to emphasize the transgressive quality of sound, the way in which it is no respecter of boundaries. In his essay, Ears Have Walls on Hearing Art, the theorist Stephen Connor says this about the diffusive nature of sound. Quote, rather than moving from source to destination like a letter or a missile, sound diffuses in all directions like a gas. Unlike light, sound goes around corners. Sound art comes not only through the wall, but round the corner and through the floor, end quote. True to form, the sounds of the scenes from young soul rebels and Tillery's freedom time sometimes run into each other at various points in the building. In a display case to the right of the stereo are the pages of a letter that Tillery wrote to the black gay writer, Joseph Bean. It's dated June 4th, 1984. As Tillery suggests, both her and Beam's works were efforts to create community for Black people, especially ones marginalized by gender and sexuality. She says to him, quote, I have been very grateful for my connection with you. I sense in you a commitment to Blackness and to yourself, which I find most appealing. I know that Black people as a whole need so much, and gay Black people need far more self-love and self-belief than possibly any other sector of our community, end quote. The letter and its lines serve as a beatitude of sorts for the bookshop. One of the blessings communicated to and believed necessary for the people who frequent it. And for the shop owners, the sound session is a means to immerse the people in the shop's raison d'etre and reach them in ways that the books and visual materials may not discussing sound's capacity to not only transgress institutional boundaries, but to create institutional settings, Connor writes, quote, sound can not only impregnate, irradiate, it can also, it seems, provide a haven or habitat, safe, as the saying is, and sound, end quote. The letter and the song join forces to distill those aspects of Black radical feminist and queer traditions that are all about constituting safe and sound habitations. Some of the listeners can be heard talking about the song's line that says, there's no savior, oh, in the struggle for freedom. They note the ways in which it references a long-standing contention within freedom movements, a dispute over charismatic and hence heteropatriarchal models of authority. The line, in fact, 
invokes an ideological and political rift within black freedom struggles in the 1960s. In her book, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, a radical democratic vision, historian Barbara Ransby addresses this rift. She writes, quote, in the historiography of modern black freedom movement, scholars have drawn a line between charismatic leadership models and grassroots activist ones with the parallel distinction between mobilizing for big events and actually organizing communities to feel empowered to assess their own needs and fight their own battles, end quote. The charismatic model favored forms of leadership embodied in heteropatriarchal figures who espoused a politics of respectability, figures like Martin Luther King. As its opposite, the direct action model espoused and honed by Baker would provide the foundations for alternatives to the gender and sexual particularities of charismatic leadership. Black, <coughs> Black feminist organizations such as Third World Women's Alliance, Third World Gay Revolution, the Kumbahi River Collective, and Sweet Honey and the Rock would become some of the primary architects of those alternatives. The song is put on repeat, and others who hear it from the adjacent rooms come into the room to listen and dance. If I could just tell you what it's really like to live this life of triple jeopardy, the song implores its listeners. No more crying, no more weeping, because I believe that I do hold up half the sky. Many in the room hear Tillery saying of triple oppressions, and their minds run back to the first time that they read Claudia Jones's 1949 article and into the neglect of the problems of Negro women. In the article, Jones implored the Communist Party to see the triple jeopardies of race, class, and gender in the histories and lives of Black women workers. She wrote, quote, to win the Negro woman for full participation in the anti-fascist anti-imperialist coalition to bring her militancy and participation to even greater heights in the current and future struggles against Wall Street imperialism. Progressives must acquire political consciousness as regards her special oppressed status, end quote. We might situate Tillery's song within this genealogy of political and intellectual development one in which race and gender are instruments for expanding the definitions of and strategies for collective liberation. Her sound would become part of this effort to produce a sonic modernity organized around anti-racist, feminist, and queer understandings of freedom as intersectional, expansive, and immersive. <laughs> In yet another room, there is a large poster on the wall across from the entrance that includes the entirety of Donna Kate Russian's poem, The Black Backups. The poem famously appears in the Black lesbian feminist anthology, Homegirls, edited by Barbara Smith. On the walls that adjoin both sides of the poster, there are bookcases, of course, and speakers next to them, one red and the other green. People wandering into the room encounter the poem and the playlist that includes Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones, Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side, and Elvis Presley's If I Can Dream. The poem itself begins, this is dedicated, dedicated to Mary Clayton, Fontella Bass, Vanetta Washington, Carolyn Franklin, Yolanda McCullough, Carolyn Willis, Gwen Guthrie, Helene Harris, and Darlene Love. This for all the Black women who sang Back Up for Elvis Presley, John Denver, James Taylor, Lou Reed, etc., etc., etc. The poem invokes the singers who provided the foundation for all the great rock songs of the 20th century. Here, Russian invokes Lou Reed's Walk on the Wild Side. Ah. 
Holly came from Miami, FLA. Hitchhiked away across USA. Plucked her eyebrows on the way, shaved her legs, and then he was a she. She says, Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. Said, Hey, honey, take a walk on the wild side. She was everybody's darling But she never lost her head Even when she was given head She says, hey babe Take a walk on the wild side Said, hey babe Take a walk on the wild side And the colored girls go Do 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 I said, hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. I, ha- I said, hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. And the color girls say, do 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 in, pre- in the proceeding stanzas, the poem invokes the histories of racialized and gendered labor and Black women's embodiment of it. Russian writes, This is dedicated to all the black women riding on buses and subways back and forth to the main line, Haddonfield, Cherry Hill, and Chevy Chase. This is for the women who spend their summers in Rockport, Newport, Cape Cod, and Camden, Maine. This is for the women who open those bundles of dirty laundry sent home from those ivy-covered campuses. The Black Backups uses sound to invoke the history of Black women's participation in reproductive labor. Indeed, Russian employs sonic elements so that the reader and hearer can establish a relationship with that history. In his discussion of sound as an incitement to relationality, Connor argues, quote, we use sound to locate things and to orient ourselves in space to take the measure of things. We take soundings or sound things out. Sound is exploratory rather than merely metric or analytic because sound does not give us just the outline or contour of things, their size, shape, or position, but also gives us the sense of their quality or their relation to us." End quote. Russian uses the poem to invoke a sonic history that itself summons a history of racialized and gendered labor. The use of sound to call up a history of of reproductive labor pushes against a historiography of sound that only imagines sonic transformations in terms of technological and industrial innovations. For instance, in his 1913 text, The Art of Noises, the futurist Luigi Rossolo wrote, quote, this revolution of music is paralleled by the increasing proliferation of machinery sharing in human labor. In the pounding atmosphere of great cities, as well as in the formerly silent countryside, machine, machines create today such a large number of varied noises that pure sound with its littleness and its monotony now fails to arouse any emotion." End quote. For Rosolo, the machines are modernity's real inventors, innovators, the ones that account for sonic variety and composition. And in this formulation, human labor is but a passing notation. For Russian, however, racialized and gendered labor form the bases of modernity's innovations where sound and economy are concerned. Indeed, the position of Black backup singers is a metaphor for the subjugated histories of modern American capital. The poem cites what the colored girls sing as more than a reference to pleasure, but to alienation as well. As Connor argues, quote, but sound is not all pleasurable. 
permutation or erotic meaning of membranes, erotic meeting of membranes, sound as Aristotle puts it, is the result of pathos, end quote. The black backups attempt to make themselves heard at the cost of a history and historiography that would place them in the rear. On this Saturday, the bookshop has attempted to reconstitute itself as a sonic universe. In doing so, it has tried to coax its patrons into hearing the sounds that emanate from the texts and images within its walls. It has also ventured to move its customers into appreciating how the sounds travel and commingle from one room to the next, not content to pre present aesthetics as divorced from materiality, the bookshop has striven to show the regulars how the sonic offerings of the films, poetry, and pictures evoke subjugated and compound histories of race, gender, sexuality, and labor. With no small measure of deliberation, the bookshop set as its task the realization of a threat from one of its favorite texts. In part one of Reading Capital, Louis Althusser said, quote, I venture to suggest that our age threatens one day to appear in the history of human culture as marked by the most dramatic and difficult trial of all, the discovery of and training in the meaning of the simplest acts of existence, seeing, listening, speaking, reading, end quote. Inspired partly by Althusser, the shop owners asked their visitors to consciously activate their identities as not only readers and viewers, but listeners also. In a defense of listening and in a meditation about the privileged place that sight has occupied in Western metaphysics, that is, sight's location as the basis of rationality, perception, mastery and theoretical truth, the anthropologist David Scott turns to the subordinated faculty of hearing in his book, Stuart Hall's Voice, Intimations of an Ethics of Receptive Generosity. Discussing the philosopher Hans Jonas's classic 1954 essay, The Nobility of Sight, Scott writes, quote, by contrast, hearing is bound to the unstable passage of time the contingent, uncertain experience of temporality. What sound discloses, Jonas eloquently discloses, is not an object per se, but a dynamic event of unfolding, surrounding, end quote. The unfolding, surrounding quality of hearing compels Scott to argue, quote, hearing therefore is not only inherently a sense of becoming rather than being, but also a sensuously gathering, enveloping mode of experience. Consequently, unlike with sight, which is, the scent, which is the sense of sovereign intellectual control, with hearing, there is always a fundamental experience of exposure and vulnerability and susceptibility." End quote. Sight may suggest transcendence, individualism, and disembodiment, but hearing implies immersion, relationality, and materiality. In the bookshop, the people then immerse themselves in a universe of sounds that is in dialogue with pictures, films, and books. And then they go through the bookshop, giving themselves over to the trials of listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, um, Rod. That was um, so stimulating and imaginative and um, full of fascinating ideas. Um, we are going to open things up for questions from our panelists and audience members. And um, uh, if you would like everyone to um, see your question, please post to panelists and attendees. It would be nice um, uh, 
for everyone to see the question if you would like to do that. But um, if not, just um, send it to the panel and I will repeat the question for Rod. Um, so I'll actually get things started off and I'm talking about posting to chat, by the way. Um, I'll get things started off. Um, so thanks again for, for this um, talk and I've um, heard a little bit of this project before and it's so fascinating to hear these new dimensions of it. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, I mean, it's so innovative the way that you're using the bookshop motif here um, and working through that motif in your own sense of structuring the project and, um, and also here adventuring through the relationship between space and sound. Um, and talking about sound rounding corners. And the idea of space is just so crucial for the way that you're thinking about your project. Um, and I was wondering whether this is connecting to new genres of presentation and scholarship in your own mind as you're moving forward with this because um, you know there's just so much here that's kind of difficult to put into print um, and and that works incredibly well um, as a PowerPoint but then there are other modes of presentation that I can imagine working really beautifully with this kind of material and so I guess just um, it's opening up this other way um, that we can talk about the just the the aspect of the archive you know this this subject of our discussion here um it's opening up this new dimension which is um what are the spatial dimensions and what are the scholarly or i guess generic dimensions of the ways in which we approach the archive so um would you like to talk about that at all just the the, the, the genres of scholarship for you? Sure, yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, well, I mean, just in terms of the people who are doing work that I think is in kin, uh, or is kin to what I'm trying to do. I mean, people, you know, like uh, Saidiya Hartman's work with, um, you know, speculation comes to mind, but also the work that Daphne Brooks and Jackie Stewart, uh, Kara Keeling are doing around like, you know, the Kumbahi River Collective mixtape, you know, that um, as a sort of sound event, you know, talking about or trying to imagine the music that um, occasion as in, and occasion the Kumbahi River Collective statement um, and also what the members themselves might have been listening to at that moment, you know, that comes to mind as well. And also in terms of the other genres or ways of expressing, um, you know, scholarship and the bookshop itself. Um, I've talked to folks here um, and at Wesley and students and colleagues after I presented various aspects of the work or talked to folks about the bookshop project and you know, people have suggested, well, why don't you try to produce an actual bookshop, you know, um, in New Haven? Uh, you know, that would be temporary, but would allow me to create the space that's being imagined in the book. Um, and in fact, there uh, are folks in architecture and in art who have put together, I understand, um, opportunities for faculty to uh, take some of the buildings um, that, or storefronts that Yale owns and then produce precisely this, you know. Um, so you could imagine then a bookshop that is open for like, you know, four to six weeks, you know, 
that uh, has visual art in it, but also has music in it and sound and as well as text. And so that's a goal after uh, the drafting and the publishing of the book itself. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, that's sort of, I, as you were going through this talk, I mean, you're so wonderful at describing the actual physical space. And I just think that um, the idea um, of that kind of multimedia space would just be so interesting and wonderful. And then, you know, the, um, the, the possibility of this really working incredibly well on film, mm -hmm. well, although um, I guess, you know, the, the tactile aspects of this would really be really amazing in just that spatial um, exhibit that you're talking about. Um, Jane Rhodes um, has a question, and Jane, do you just want to unmic there? Hi, Jane. Hey, Rod. In part, I wanted to say hello, um, and great to hear the latest iteration of this project, which we've been talking about for years. Um, yeah. So um, this, that was wonderful. And, and I wanted to sort of ask you to talk a little bit about the role of memory in this process, mm -hmm. because as, as I was listening to your paper, you triggered all of these memories. I mean, when was the last time I heard Linda Tillery? Linda Tillery, right? Right, or saw Isaac Julian's Young Soul Rebels and so forth, you know. And I think um, that we had a conversation this morning about memory, and, and I think that, that the, the place of memory in the archive and that, that intersection. Um, so, how is that working for your project? Because you're actually talking about the material, um, but it seems that uh, memory is sort of deeply embedded in everything you're doing. Oh, completely. No, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at with the objects to show how the objects are evocative and that there's a kind of animating quality in the objects. If you're talking about um, the VHS or DVD copy of Young Soul Rebels, or the physical copy of the book. And if we had access to, if I had access to my office, I would have you know, taken a picture of my old copy of Diary of Young Soul Rebels and used it you know, um, as one of the images. And um, I see that as tapping into a few genealogies. One has to do with just the emphasis that um, women of color feminists uh, in general, if you think about um, uh, feminist genealogies, uh, colonial legacies, democratic futures, the book that Chandra Mohanty and um, Jackie Alexander did, or the um, before that, the book that Mohanty edited, Third World Feminisms, or this is Bridge Call My Back, where so much of the discussion is about the role of memory you know, um, and counter memory as part of um, an anti-racist feminist practice. And so that's one thing that I want to invoke. The other thing I also want to invoke is just the memories of, um, that you experience when you walk into a bookshop or a bookstore that reminds you of your first black bookshop or your first women's, you know, bookstore. And so what inspired this motif in this project is when I went to an exhibition called No Color Bar several years back, I think in maybe 2013, maybe 2014, um, actually with Avery Gordon, who may be on this call at the Guild Hall Gallery in uh, London. And it was a simulation of the Bogo Le Vauture bookshop started by Eric and Jessica Huntley, which was one of the black bookshops, you know, in London. And, and it brought back all these memories that I had of my first black bookshop, which was the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Atlanta. And I remember walking into the gallery and they 
had display cases with letters that you know Eric had written to Jessica. There were on the walls the art from uh, the bookstore. There was also um, Jessica's typewriter and her desk, you know, as well as these um, facsimiles of the book cases that were in the bookshop itself. And then there was this beautiful poem, and I've been trying to find the poem, um, and the poet that was run over the audio. And it was this guy with a Jamaican accent, and it, it's this beautiful poem, but it had this refrain, these black bookshops, these black bookshops, and it was all about what the bookshops meant. And so, hence the immersive um, quality of sound you know, from the bookshop itself. So I want to also, in, and I remember there was also an Af another African American woman uh, at the exhibition when I was there and she said, I remember my first bookshop, black bookshop too, from being here. And then, you know, you could always guarantee that you walk into those bookshops and you would smell incense. <laughs> or you would hear music, you would hear people discussing the latest political issue. And so um, I'm trying to figure out ways in the writing of the text uh, to invoke those memories, right? Um, so yeah, if it invoked, you know, Linda Tillery and Young So Rebels for you, then mission accomplished. Thank you for that, Rod. Um, Jenny Breyer has a question. I'll just hand the mic to you, Jenny. Mark, um, thank you, Rod, for that beautiful talk and the way it made me feel. I appreciate it very much. Um, it's, a, it's actually an interesting, it's a follow-up in some ways to this conversation that you and Jane were just having, which is um, about how to think about um, audio recordings of oral histories as mm -hmm. part of the sound that belongs there um, in the bookshop. Um, and um, really, I think one of the techniques that I know I use, and I, I've learned it from other oral historians who are much more skilled than me, is to sit down with people and look at material culture mm -hmm. as a way to get them to think about. So Jane, giving that, saying that, you know, like one of the things that I do when I sit down with people is I ask them to bring out photographs that we can look at together and they mm -hmm. can, I can, we can record the sound of their memory happening at the moment of their seeing, mm -hmm. which is sort of back to this question of how the seeing and the hearing mm -hmm. work together. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder if, if that's actually another source of, of sound archive for you to think mm -hmm. about for the bookshop mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, how that might function. And then I just wanted to say that years ago, I, I was thinking um, when I was first sort of conceptualizing history moves of setting up memory shops mm -hmm. in different places mm -hmm. where people could um, do that work, you know, like there would be the something to experience and then there would be a way to, 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 to record the audio of their conversations about it and to sort of just ground other ways of, think about other ways of, um, of holding on to without containing those memories. So I just wanted to sort of put that out there as a possibility for you to yeah, think no, about. Yeah, those are great suggestions and, um, I take the suggestion to, part of what inspires me to think about is how to use um, recordings, like get people together to talk about, okay, tell me about when you first heard Linda Tillery, you know, or when you first heard, or when you first watched, you know, Young Soul Rebels, or um, in the photo that I showed you from the Battle of Lewisham on the very far, um, let's see, it was my left, so I'm not sure what that was for you. There's a young black woman with specs on, you know, with her fist in the air. That's Gail Lewis, you know, my dear friend Gail Lewis, um, the black feminist activist and theorist uh, in the UK. And so um, to actually convene a group 
you know, so that people can talk about those things. And then for one, me to sort of incorporate that into the bookshop and the text itself. But then also two, once the pop-up bookshop is in existence to have that playing, but also to have, what do you call it? A memory device? What's it called? A memory shop. A memory shop in the bookshop mm -hmm. you know, where people can come yeah. and um, talk about their memories. And right. then, so that can then be archived. Right. You know, later on after the shop is taken down, you know, like that's a fabulous idea. You can also make an um, an, an ebook, and you can have the audio inside the ebook. So I encourage you to think about that, Rod, okay. if you're going to yeah. do the yeah 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 the sort of hybrid book model. Okay, cool, excellent. Hi, Avery. I see Avery. Or yes, and I believe Avery has a question. Go ahead. I can't hear. Um, it was lovely to hear to hear this presentation. And I just, I actually had a question um, to ask you in the follow-up to your answer to, to Mark about the possibility of creating an actual bookshop mm -hmm. and how this would impact what I understand is the more, um, how shall we say, non-singular nature of the bookshop. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about space, but as far as I've understood this project, so I really want to know if I've misunderstood it, there isn't necessarily one bookshop. Yeah. <laughs> that the bookshop, um, there are multiple bookshops, um, it kind of more in that Escher sense of, so yeah, I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the conception of the book. Yeah, 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 no, totally. So I, I mean, it's in my mind, it kind of um, like Borges's the library mm -hmm. of Babylon, things are called. And then even like, you know, the play Our Town, where like you never know where that town is. <laughs> so there's a kind of anonymity to the town. So I want there to be a kind of anonymity to the bookshop. I also want the bookshop um, to be um, in multiple, well, that the bookshop, it couldn't possibly contain all of these rooms and elements right. here, right? Like, you know, so exactly. there's a kind of magical realist aspect to the bookshop, but also to suggest that there are multiple bookshops. So there are times when the reader may be confused and deliberately so on my part, what, that you think you've located the bookshop in one place, and then it's like, well, it's can't, it, it's not that place, it's another place. You know, I actually want that to also happen from chapter to chapter as well, so that it then raises the question of, you know, is the bookshop um, singular or is it multiple? And also, um, if the bookshop is on, you know, a corner in a black neighborhood, how is it that the bookshop has what looks like catacombs you know that you know never end as well so i you know that's part of the magical realist aspect of the bookshop that i want to sort of cultivate well i always thought that the bookshop of black queer diaspora was certainly on the utopian margins and was yeah. an allied you know friend of the hawthorne archive the september yeah. institute exactly. run by renee green exactly. and so yeah. on so yeah and i should so, mention you know in my sort of um recounting of the books that you know, have inspired. I mean, you know, like the one, the, you know, the text and the person who I've been in closest dialogue with about, you know, imagining this um, is Avery, you know. Uh, Avery was the one who introduced me to, who took me to, with Colin Prescott, to the No Color Bar. And she said, why not make it into a bookshop? And I thought, oh, that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> But it's it's such a beautiful project, and and I love especially when it's going to be in whatever book form, whether it's a film book or mm -hmm. Mark's idea of having multiple genre formats for it. I think is really interesting. But when you're when we're going to see it as a book, there's going to be exactly this multiple universe of bookshops that yeah, yeah, has got yeah. that magic realist element that you've yeah because yeah. when you when you get 
when you have more than one tour going at at once <laughs> yeah because yeah because you're giving us kind of a tour of it oh right it, um right yeah it's, it's beautiful thank you yeah and um you know i mean also back to sort of mark's question that this is my first time really dealing with sound and so i just started reading all of these you know kind of sound studies anthologies and i thought okay the way to kind of learn this material is to imagine it as space you know so even in just the writing of the bookshop as a place where one like you know the sound of young soul rebel spills into the other room it was literally a way for me just to sort of figure out what these theorists were talking about because it's a very new literature for me and so i thought okay well the way in which i can learn this theoretical literature that's very new for me is just to kind of write it into the architecture of um, the space and into the speculative aspects of the book, of this chapter at least. May, may I say something else? Are there other people waiting to ask questions? Uh, go ahead. Um, I think we have um, a, a question from TK but if you just want to follow up, we, we do have time for that. I just, I just want to follow up really quickly and say one of um, my most fabulous doctoral students, um, Matthew Harris, hmm. who's actually in Black Studies and Religious Studies, is writing an amazing dissertation around um, Sanra as oh. not an individual, but as a collective name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the orchestra, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and so Matt's really focused on the time in Chicago. And one of the things that all the things you were saying, the way you were talking about sound really might, reminded me of the way he's been writing about how in those early years, the flyers and the invitations, in effect, that um, Sun Ra or Orchestra produced to get people into these roving dance clubs. Right. Uh, was all about making the appeal on the very terms that you've been talking about. You know, come and find us in outer space. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's the resonance is really... Okay, well, I'll pass this um, text on to you to pass on to him if you'd like to be in dialogue. Well, I will, and he can pass back. <laughs> yeah, totally. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from... TK and TK, if you'd like to unmute, you can go ahead and talk. Hi, Roderick. Thank Hi. you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a DJ in addition to being an archivist and librarian, so I particularly appreciated how you weaved music into uh, recreating these memories for us. Um, and I was also curious if you bring other senses into this imagination of the bookshop and if olfactory uh, memories and senses play a role in it as well. I knew you were going to say smell. I have yet to write that chapter, but I have an intention to write that chapter on smell. Like I said, you know, I mean, you just, you know, you couldn't walk into one of these bookshops without smelling incense, you know, or, you know, coconut oil, you know, or patchouli, right? you know, and yeah. so, I mean, right now I have to just sort of think about, just make a list of all of the smells that one would smell in a black bookshop or in a feminist bookshop, you know? Um, and see what I come up with. But those are the ones that immediately come to mind. Right. Yeah, and I forget actually who said to me first, well, what about the smells, you know? Um, and I was like, yeah, I. You know, at first I got to get the sound down. Like you know, it was a it was a it was a yeah. big accomplishment for me just to sort of <laughs> as someone who's never really worked in sound to um, to get that down. So I have to then figure out, okay, we'll do the reading on smell, and then also figure out, you know, how does the architecture invoke smells, and you know, um, is it through incense? Is it through I mean, as I'm talking also, it's also people's hair. Like you would smell the, um, you know, the sort of, um, you know, what do you call them? The, um, I'm blanking, the essential oils. Mm -hmm. 
people's locks and things, or you know, the um, the shea butter on their hands. I mean, you know, it was it was also just a very sensual experience. I remember once when I said when I was a teenager, I grew up in rural Georgia in Manchester, Georgia. And so going to the Shrine of the Black Madonna in Atlanta was always a special thing because it was, you know, also it meant I was taking a trip, you know, to go visit family members for the weekend or whatever. And one of my aunts who introduced me to the shrine uh, through a gift of books that she gave me. And, and I won't tell that story, that's another long story. But anyway, uh, when I first went to the shrine, um, she took me and I said to her, well, can we go to the Shrine of the Black Madonna? And it was a Saturday. And then she said, oh, you know, like, um, you know, she did this. She's like, oh, I have to get, I have to get dressed, you know, <laughs> for the Shrine. Because like, you know, you also knew that people were going to be fabulous, you know, um, that uh, they were going to be adorned, you know, and you might meet somebody. <laughs> that was the other thing. <laughs> so that's the other thing that, um, the um, photographer, um, Black British queer photographer, uh, and also sex radical Ajamu said to me when I gave this talk in London afterwards, he said, well, you know, you also need to talk about the sex and the eroticism, you know, in the bookshops. So many senses. To, so many senses. To explore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's an organization called, I think it's Institute for Olfactory Studies oh, here wow. in Los Angeles. And I know that they work with artists to recreate that olfactory experience oh, in, cool. in different oh. art installations. And so when people were talking about, you know, setting up these oh, memory cool. pop-up shops, that was another idea that came oh. to mind as well. Would you put their um, web address in the chat so I can get Absolutely. to Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ronak had a, um, a uh, reference for you. He says, um, Ronak Kapadia, um, yeah. of this project, you probably have the citation, but check out um, Micah Salkin's book, on 80s Chicago House Music. Um, it's like on the queer underground. Oh, it's it on my list and in my queue. Thank you. And I don't want to interrupt the conversation, but I just need to, to squeeze in here that um, Paige is bringing this to everyone's attention, that um, please do not log out of the session, otherwise you will not be able to get back in. This is for panelists and also attendees. Oh, okay. Okay. We're trying to correct the problem, but um, for the moment, we're not able to get in once you get out. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to allow people to, you know, slowly trickle in. I'm only going to give about one to two minutes because we want to get things uh, rolling for the afternoon. And um, I see that Marsha is with us, so that's fantastic. Um, and I will go into introduction of the round table um, in a couple of minutes. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, folks. Great to see you. Hi, Scylla. Thanks for joining us. Sure, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Jeffrey, I like that we're both wearing stripes. I know, it's got some color and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we need all the color right now. We need mm -hmm. all of that vibrancy. You do, lots of light. Yes. I believe that we have solved our technology problem. We were having a little bit of a Zoom challenge, and I do see people entering. Um, so I think things are okay. Um, Paige, are, are you there? Are, are things looking better for us? Yep. <clears throat> Everyone should be able to get in 
um, now, so it's all good. Um, thank you so much for <laughs> that out. Um, thank goodness that you're there and not me. <laughs> because <laughs> um, anyone who knows what I'm like around technological issues, um, uh, my reaction is usually just blind panic. <laughs> it's really great that you're just so able. <laughs> okay, so we've reached uh, two minutes after, so we're going to start uh, this afternoon's programming. My name is Kalee Warren. I am assistant professor and special collections librarian for University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, our next session is a roundtable on the archive in slash of the community and will be moderated by Marsha Walker McWilliams. She is the executive director of the Black Metropolis Research Consortium which is hosted by the University of Chicago. The BMRC facilitates the discovery, preservation, and use of Black historical collections. I now turn it over to Marcia. Thank you, Kali, for that introduction. And I'm excited to be able to moderate this wonderful panel on the archive in, uh, of the community. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the very impressive bios of all of our presenters. Um, starting uh, right now, they are really great and wonderful. And uh, panelists, I'm going to read them in the order that you will be presenting. So first, we have Jennifer Breyer, is a professor of gender and women's studies and history at UIC. She specializes in US sexuality and gender history and public history. Breyer wrote Infectious Ideas, U.S. Political Response to the Aid Crisis, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2009. She has curated numerous historical exhibitions, including Out in Chicago for the Chicago History Museum, Surviving and Thriving, AIDS, Politics and Culture, a traveling exhibition for the National Library of Medicine, and I'm Still Surviving, a transmedia living women's history of HIV AIDS. She was named the 2018 UIC Distinguished Scholar of the Year and was a 2019-2020 University of Illinois Public Voices Fellow. Welcome, Jenny. Skyla S. Hearn is the inaugural manager of archives, leading the new Cook County Historic Archives and Records Office to establish an archive center. Previously, she established the archive center and Drs. Charles V. and Donna C. Hamilton Institute for Research and Civic Involvement at the DuSable Museum of African American History. Skyla has over a decade of archival management, instruction, and leadership experience as an archivist, special collections librarian, and adjunct assistant professor. She is also co-founder of the Blackivist Collective, executive board of Shorefront Legacy Center, advisor for the National Public Housing Museum, Oral History Corps, and the Obsidian Collection. Skyla has a bachelor's degree in communications and media arts with specializations in photography, cinematography, and Black American studies, as well as an MS in library and information science certificate in special collections from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Welcome, Skyla. John D'Amelio is Professor Emeritus of History and Gender and Women's Studies at UIC and also president of the Board of Directors of the Gerber Hart Library and Archives. He is author of numerous books that are landmarks in gay studies, including Sexual Politics, Sexual Communities, The Making of a Homosexual Minority in the United States, Intimate Matters, A History of Sexuality in America with Estelle Friedman, now in its third edition, and The World Turned, Essays on Gay History, Politics, and Culture. Lost Prophet, The Life and Times of Bayard Rustin was a National Book Award finalist and his brand new book with the University of Chicago Press is Queer Legacies, Stories from Chicago's LGBTQ Archives. Welcome, John. Tisa Matheson is a member of the Nez Perce tribe and has ancestral roots in central Idaho and is a third generation of cultural preservation specialists. She has lived in Spokane, Washington for over 20 years. 
Tisa has worked with the American Indian Collection at the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture since 2001. She has a, a master's in library and information science degree with a focus on cultural records from San Jose State University. Tisa's passion of work includes North American indigenous material, cultural and archive material. She also serves as a tribal liaison between the museum and tribes. Welcome Tisa. Jeffrey Q. McCune Jr. is a professor of African and African American studies and women, gender and sexuality studies at Washington University in St. Louis and is the author of the award-winning book, Sexual Discretion, Black Masculinity and the Politics of Passing. He is presently completing two book projects, Disobedient Reading, An Experiment in Seeing Black and the other on the wildness of Kanye West titled On Kanye. He is the co-editor of the University of California Press's New Sexual Worlds book series, and he has been featured on Left of Black, Sirius XM's Joe Madison Show, HuffPost Live, NPR, and as a guest on Bill Nye Saves the World. As of June 2021, he will assume the role as director of the Frederick Douglass Institute of African and African American Studies at the University of Rochester. Welcome, Jeffrey. So Marcia, can... I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that Tisa is not here. Oh. Unfortunately, she's not um, in the room, in the Zoom room. So just continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. Great. No problem, Kali. Thank you for letting us know. Um, so as you can see, we have a really great lineup of wonderful folks um, who are going to talk more about their um, experience with archives in and of the community. So I'll turn it over to uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much for, for that introduction and to be on um, this in this conversation with people um, and also just in the context of what we've heard the last um, day and a half. It's just a real honor for me to, to get to be in dialogue with people who are thinking about issues of, um, of archive and memory in the ways that they are. I'm, I'm really excited and my mind is kind of moving all around right now, so I'm gonna try and do my best. Um, I'm gonna talk for about seven minutes. I'm gonna time myself um, and I'm gonna show you a few things in a minute uh, that hopefully will um, help illustrate part of what I'm doing. Um, so we were given a set of questions um, to sort of think about. I answered some of them. I'll read you the questions that I'm answering and then I'll sort of talk about them. There were a lot of them, so I could only answer a few. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to Tina Dillon, who is a captioner, who is doing an amazing job captioning this um, program and uh, I've actually been reading it as it's been being spoken and it's really helped me recognize how much I need both of these things. I need to be able to hear it and read it in terms of the way that I learn. So I just wanted to thank her for her work. Um, she's, she's really been doing a great job. So the first question that we got asked was, what is an archive and how, by whom is it appraised or curated? Um, and so, you know, I'm a historian, I'm not an archivist, so I rely on archives. I don't often think about producing them. Um, but right now I am in the middle of producing what I would call a collaborative and potentially circumstantial archive. I am working to document and detail um, what I'm calling a living women's history of HIV AIDS in America, in the United States. Um, and so I'm I'm bringing together and collaborating with a group of women who, many of whom have been living with HIV for 40 years, um, to, to understand their, their lives and their experiences as something that is very much about the history of HIV, but is also very much about the history of living in America. Um, primarily, uh, the group of women are Black or African American. Um, there are a handful of Latina and a handful of white women, but it is largely a story of how black women have lived um, the last 40 years of their lives under a range of circumstances um, that have sought to discipline them um, and sort of act on them in particular ways, including sort of real mechanisms of surveillance. Um, 
But so it really is for me um, a place where we're able to ask um, a group of women who have been, um, many of them, part of lots of different research studies. So their, their bodies are part of a natural history archive of women and HIV. There, many of them are part of the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is the longest running longitudinal study of women and HIV in the country. And it's one that holds a huge amount of archival data, although they, they would call it sort of biological information. Um, and this is really the first time that many of the women in that group have been in charge of how, what they share and how they share it. And so I really see the work that we're doing in the Living Women's History of HIV as a, a way of being memory keepers. And we focus on three types of media, three types of archival material, image, audio, and text. And after listening to Stacey Williams talk earlier this morning, I'm really struck by how deeply um, I need to begin to grapple with what it means to be collecting in cyberspace, because it is a largely born digital archive. I want to introduce you to Deborah. I'm going to share my screen um, here. This is Deborah. Deborah is one of the women in the project who um, was born and raised in Chicago on the north side in Rogers Park. Um, here is a, f a Polaroid picture of her from when she got sober in 1992. And right here next to it are two cards. They say they're bright orange and they have redaction in them and they say Cook County Hospital, 1835 West Harrison Street, always bring this card with you. And I sat at a table of women on the west side of Chicago about five or six years ago and I asked them what objects they had in their life that could help them, could help someone else understand their experience. Um, most of these women had grown up on the south or west sides of Chicago, some in Rogers Park. And to a person, every single one of them took out this orange card, this orange card from Cook County Hospital and said, this is the, the card and the color and the document that was the way I could access healthcare at Cook County. And so what we decided to, what we ended up doing with the project was to collect um, their photographs of their everyday lives and these kinds of ephemera and really think about how holding those together could allow us to understand something about women's lives in a particular way and they would be things that I think will belong in the archive. I'm going to share with you another, um, another piece of Deborah's history and that is her, um, her voice. So hold on one second. In the penitentiary with my youngest daughter with a friend my second diagnosis in five years still not knowing what it is that i have got out of the penitentiary and there was a dcfs worker waiting for me at the gate and he told me that if i thought I wanted my kids back, I probably wouldn't get them back because I had HIV. But he brought me to the wrong place. He took me to the Fantas Clinic at Stroger Hospital. Exactly. Well, what year was that? This was 91. Okay. Well, who was there? At the same same time. times. Same okay. time. Yeah. And, you know, that was his mistake, taking me to exactly. the Fantas Clinic because not only did they educate me about HIV, they educated me about my rights concerning HIV and, you know, that nobody could take my child simply because, mm -hmm. you know, there were people trying to. Yes, because the... Um. I'll end by saying that people living with and dying from HIV AIDS have been among the most important and prolific producers of archives of that experience. And while most of that has tended to focus on men, I think it's important to name how um, 
women's history, both archivally and in the, in the work of their own voices and their own sense of interpretation and their own ability to build connections with one another. As you hear there, Deborah in dialogue with her interviewer, Marilyn, um, we can really start to see how, what it might mean to produce this living women's history of HIV as an archive that can tell us about both um, the history of various communities and places, about the history of um, the epidemic and what it means to still be living with that epidemic today as we are also experiencing another global pandemic. And also really to think about how the material culture of women's lives who have um, often not been, um, who have often not been held in the, sorry now, no, I can't even stop it. Who have, who have also not been held in archives. And that's part of what Marisa Fuentes talked about yesterday in the talk about redaction, what it means to sort of think about redaction and what it means to think about people able to save shards of their lives and then how we can think about producing and holding those in collaborative archives that are made both for, um, for uh, future scholars, but more importantly, for people who are living, um, who are living in our current moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing um, that. Please do uh, remember to place questions that you have for our panelists and comments in the chat, and we'll get to those after uh, all of the presenters have um, shared their remarks. Uh, next up, we'll have Skyla Hearn. Thank you, Marsha. Um, and um, thank you all again uh, for inviting me to be a part of this program today. Um, there have been some very powerful stories uh, that have been shared, and I just want to um, just simply say thank you. Um, so uh, this is uh, my uh, presentation is entitled An Unfurling of a Legacy Holder, Institutional and Community Archivist. Initially, I came here today to outline for you the responsibilities of the work related to my position as the Chief Archivist and Special Collections Librarian at the DuSable Museum of African American History. But since accepting this invitation, which I received sometime last year, I believe, to participate in different archives, different histories, I have accepted the role of Manager of Archives for Cook County Government, which is an inaugural position under the Office of the President of the Board of Commissioners, which I began in June of 2020. Both roles reflect the brain trust and radical vision of forward thinking black women who throughout their lives and careers champion equitable and just communities outfitted with educational systems that will not only teach but nurture and empower learners to build skills for continued knowledge development, but to also connect to and influence and influence the world in which they live. One being an activist, artist, institution builder, and art history educator. The other, a history teacher and civil servant. The scope of the work of Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burrow, Burroughs, principal founder of the, of the DuSable Museum of African American History and the Southside Community Art Center, and, the, and President Tony Preckwinkle, president of the Board of Commissioners of Cook County, the second largest county in the United States, supersedes the city, the county, the disciplines of history, cultural studies, et cetera, and places heavy attention and focus on the responsibilities of transforming oppressive systems of erasure through creating centers and spaces of civic engagement and involvement by providing equitable, nonviolent opportunities for communities, residents, those within neighborhoods, institutional, small organizational structures, the tools to craft understanding and to bridge connections between local and world citizens, to deepen the context from which they exist, we exist, to broaden and connect to how others live and navigate in the close proximity as well as beyond in the global community. 
to support the ability of a people to deepen an understanding of not only their own history, but to understand how those narratives overlap and are deeply rooted in the overarching historical narrative. When we speak of communities, who are the groups we are referring to? As the decision makers in the archives, in the academy, as this conversation is currently taking place uh, here at UIC and other sectors, we have to account for all the considerations and components of who comprise communities while taking into account the importance and intentionality towards relationships we foster, the narratives we safeguard and activate. My vocation in the archives began in the academy, but was homegrown and cemented by the relationships and archives I supported within communities, specifically black communities and contributors from, for the most part, who lived, worked, or established community archives on the south side of Chicago. It was during the conversations, the search and discovery in the archives, sitting with donors, um, being invited into more interpersonal and intimate settings, that I began to juxtapose the very nature of the archive, of an archives, that's lowercase a archives, capital A, <laughs> excuse me, capital case A archives, um, to critique just what and who archives represented and by whom. These initial engagements revealed to me that there were voids in the records and just how systemic these practices of erasure are. That, re that revelation, excuse me, was painful, but because once again, as with an educational exploration and now as a, as a practitioner, learning just how expansive the holes are, which, be which then became the catalyst to jumpstart my work as a change agent and active archivist to work towards transforming how archives re represent lesser known marginalized peoples and communities to challenge the many changes needed in developing more inclusive records and policies. The discussions pertaining to the need to collect history as it happens has shaped re recent acquisitions of materials related to Black Lives Matter protests and COVID-19. Back in March, when these conversations began, I found myself in a weird place, as I'm sure most of us did, between being completely terrified, petrified even actually, and wanting to jump into full action. The challenge for me was more so not knowing which direction to move in while awaiting instruction from leadership. Um, as in most institutions with many emergent responsibilities, archives may not, <laughs> um, you know, uh, be at the tip top of the list. Uh, so I decided to return to my community archiving roots to reach out to my network, my friends, my colleagues, and so on to gather strength, right? Because we're in that moment. We still are. Um, as well as learn first how they were, well, I mean, you know, so I'm reaching out to them for strength, but, you know, my first course of action, of course, was to learn, you know, like how they were doing how they were coping and then you know our conversation moved into how they were approaching their work at their respective institutions so essentially i became an archivist who was archiving archivists um with at, without excuse me as much focus on developing a robust archive of trauma and triumph um, at my institution but with more of a focus on how we as the memory workers, information professionals, archivists were strategically moving forward to address the questions related to the current moment while sustaining ourselves in the moment of conducting the work and embracing um, community histories we deeply and tirelessly work to preserve as institutional and community archivists. So, you know, in having conversations around how to be, um, how to truly be there for communities and making their stories truly important and not just elevating the roles of institutions. Um, some groups and projects that I am a part of um, are the Blackivist Collective, um, Honey Park Performance, uh, and the National Public Housing Museum, where 
we've been talking about the needs of foregrounding communities and putting ourselves at their service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Skyla. Um, next up, we have um, John. Hi. Well, thank you very much. I have to say, it's really been wonderful to listen to all these presentations over the last day and a half. It's given me quite a lot to think about. Uh, and I probably want to say that uh, my presentation today is going to be more informative than deeply analytical. Uh, so I'm framing my remarks actually around the Gerber Hart Library and Archives. And uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with it, Gerber Hart is a community-based LGBTQ history archives, uh, as well as a circulating library and cultural center here in Chicago. It was founded in 1981 at a time when community history projects and archives of one sort or another were taking off in a number of cities uh, as a response to the way that LGBTQ history was ignored or dismissed by the academic and publishing world. Um, and you know, to give a personal story, in the 1970s when I was doing my dissertation research on a quote gay topic, at least 90% of my research was done in the homes of individuals or in the offices of movement organizations. There was no archival record that I was aware of. Um, uh, and all of these organizations that were forming then in the 70s and 80s, at least the ones that I know about, um, including Gerber Hart, consciously saw themselves as part of a movement for social change and social justice. Um, in its four decades, Gerber Hart has moved several times. It was initially located in a basement in Lakeview uh, in which there were no temp temperature controls for its archival collections. Uh, it's now in a very welcoming space um, in Rogers Park. Until the last four or five years, it's been entirely volunteer run and operated. Um, it now has uh, three part-time staff, but Put, you put their hours together and it's less than one full-time employee. So in that sense, you could say really, Gerber Hart is very much in and of a community. Uh, without the support of many volunteers over the years, it would never have survived. Um, and, but at the same time, it means that there have been real limits uh, that it has experienced in how it can fulfill its mission to both collect and preserve history and make it accessible in a meaning, as a meaningful tool for social change and social justice. Um, what are some of its strengths? Um, in the recent period, um, the, it's probably its signature event has become its exhibits. Uh, they're curated by volunteers uh, who use materials from the archives. We have a new one every five months or so. Uh, recent ones include, uh, and they've really been wonderful, uh, Lavender Women and Killer Dykes uh, about lesbian feminism in Chicago. Uh, Hugh, Activism on the Margins of Identity in the 90s, uh, which explores a range of non-normative sexual and gender identities that made themselves visible in the wake of Queer Nation. Um, a history of drag performance in Chicago that stretched across the 20th century. Uh, and uh, the curators uh, used, uh, used and found wonderful materials from the Chicago Defender as an example. Um, the openings are wonderful events. Uh, over 100 people come to these things. Uh, and as the title suggests, the focus has been on both activism and, and community building and community creation. Um, we also have a lot of events that are panel discussions by activists from earlier eras um, and things like that. The collections, another strength is uh, the collections and the people who use them. Um, we have over 150 archival collections of personal papers and organizational records, um, an extensive collection of periodicals and ephemera. Uh, 
broad range from materials about a lifelong female impersonator, impersonator drag performer, uh, to uh, a collection on a citywide voter campaign in the 1980s. Um, the collections have been used by professional historians and writers. So uh, the book uh, Queer Clout by Timothy Stewart Winter of Rutgers uh, is about Chicago and a lot of the research was done at Gerber Hart. Um, Rebecca Mackay, who has the, had this best-selling novel a year or two ago, The Great Believers, did a lot of work at Gerber Hart. Uh, but the users also include a lot of high school and students who are researching their history essays for the Chicago Metro History Fair, where Gerber Hart sponsors a prize for the best essay in LGBTQ history. Um, and in non-pandemic times, really, a stream of high school and college classes get to tour the archives and take a peek into the kind of materials that Gerber Hart contains. And I've been there occasionally when there's been a group of high school students, and they're just there in awe at seeing all of this material in, in one place. Um, there's also the relevance of the collections. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we're taught, we ta we, expressions we hear today a lot in, in the pandemic is PPE. Um, well, uh, for now, my, my PPE will be pandemic, police, and elections. Um, one of the collections we have is the pap papers related to black and white men together. And although it was a social group when it got started, you go through the collections and you see the amount of community organizing and education that they did around the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s, which was essentially being ignored by the government, especially in African-American communities. And it's like, oh, yes, the pandemic today, the AIDS epidemic then, um, or, police. Um, we have materials on something called the Transvestite Legal Committee from uh, 1971, a transgender activist organization, and it was formed in response to Chicago police shooting in the back and killing an unarmed African-American trans woman. And so you look at this collection, you realize the long history of the police violence that we are protesting against today. Um, or we have the papers of someone like Carol Powell, uh, who directed a voter registration campaign for the LGBT community in Chicago in 1988, presidential election year, that registered so many voters that it really created an unmistakable sense of, oh, this is a part of our political community. And a month after the campaign was over, the Chicago City Council passed a sexual orientation non-discrimination act. So, I mean, these collections sort of speak to sort of the politics and the challenges that we're facing today. Um, I wanna say just a little bit about the challenges we face. Um, we are always operating on the margins. Uh, for instance, only in recent years have the collections finally been processed and finding aids created. Uh, we have very modest hours. Uh, we're only open 16 hours a week, uh, two afternoons, two evenings. Um, we, the way we've acquired, I say we, but Gerber Hart really over its decades when I wasn't there, the way it's acquired collections is it's almost like it says, well, we're here, bring us something, as opposed to proactively going out into the community and acquiring collections that would reflect the full diversity of community membership. Um, and then, you know, there's the ongoing issue of constantly outgrowing our space, having to move again, uh, having just enough money to stay open, but not to do really wonderful and amazing things. Uh, and I think almost anybody who involved with Gerber Hart has fantasies about the surprise bequest that will arrive one day and change everything for all of us. Um, the one thing, the last thing I wanna say is uh, 
In terms of the pandemic, I mean, obviously that's been a, a challenge for all nonprofits, but for us, it's turned out to be this surprise because it served as a spur for us to have a much greater online presence. And in the last six months, Gerberhardt has put a lot of materials onto its website, uh, archival materials. So um, I guess what I'd leave you with is that the work that Gerberhardt has done over the years has been very important. Um, it's made it possible for a lot of people to discover a history they knew nothing about, but oh my God, there's so much more that could be done. So I'll, I'll leave with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, has, is, has Tisa joined us? Sorry, no, and I've been looking for our communication. So just continue on. Thank you for asking. Yes, we haven't been able to locate her, sorry. No worries, we will continue on. So uh, next up, we'll have Jeffrey. Thank you so much for having me and for um, allowing me to be a part of this great conversation with people who I hold dear to my heart and to my mind uh, and to the work that we all do. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, for Mark for inviting me and for Kelly and others who organized this uh, great event uh, and great conversation and necessary conversation. And I'm gonna kind of continue a little bit um, where uh, Marisa Fuentes left off yesterday uh, in terms of thinking about um, kind of anti-Black violence and how it is that we um, acquire narratives that would uh, advance a much more, um, or that would deepen our understanding of how it is that anti-Blackness uh, shifts and changes uh, the landscape on which we live, right? Um, and so I happen to be um, moving to uh, St. Louis in 2013 and the next following year on August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown will be killed. And immediately I was charged with uh, being a faculty leader who would organize around uh, 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 against anti-blackness and also to organize how our community partnerships within work because of course the university now is is responding to uh, what black folks are, are saying and doing uh, in the surrounding communities and uh, one of the, the first initiatives that we started was what we called the documenting Ferguson um, archive which everyone can have access to it's open access um, even if you still have some stuff like you came here for Ferguson and you want to uh, deposit uh, images, pictures, photographs, songs, uh, any type of artifact, <clears throat> any type of art archival material is welcomed in that space. And so um, it was a, a project for us to actually create a kind of real-time space for documenting the action in Ferguson. And I was uh, at the time in conversations with uh, a, um, a I'll say a thought partner, uh, Clarissa Hayward, uh, who is a political scientist here at Washington University. Um, and in our conversations, we were trying to figure out uh, how we could be participants in this Documenting Ferguson project. And one of the ways in which we became kind of participants was through uh, thinking about how uh, we might use our ethnographic and oral history uh, backgrounds to facilitate new conversations. And so what, what a lot of people were doing were they're like, oh, I want to interview somebody. So they interviewed Tracy Blackman, Reverend Tracy Blackman or Reverend Starsky Wilson or, you know, these kind of uh, big players, activists with a big A, right? And we were trying to figure out who was marginalized in the media's um, kind of archive and also who was being marginalized within the quote unquote official institutional archives, right? And of course, it was those folks um, like KB Frazier and Alexis Templeton, who actually would become a leader in the movement, um, who were kind of left out of, of the puzzle. And so rather than like offer you a, a quite, kind of formal uh, remark as I could often give, uh, which is my tendency, <laughs> um, I'm actually going to render their words to you. 
um, because I think that um, one, um, these are words that have yet to been included into the larger Documenting Ferguson archive, but two, I think they illuminate uh, the importance of a community built archive. And just a little bit about the process. <clears throat> One of the things that was unique about our creation of this Ferguson Oral History Project was that we actually invited folks from the community to do some of the kind of interview work, right? And so we had a kind of training with folks from the community, got our IRB approval and all that, right? Um, but we had folks from the community who, and students, right, who partnered together both being equally, you know, um, less knowledgeable of how this thing works, right? How do you do oral history? And so we met several times. I had a summer training in 2015 and then developed this kind of uh, protocol for how we wanted to proceed. And so you'll see uh, in the presentation of these particular uh, narratives, some of the questions and conversations that were being had. So the first question is kind of asking you to go back to the first time you got involved, KB. What do you remember about that moment? Did something happen that initially got you involved? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm very clear about it. It was August 10th. There was a prayer vigil at the police station. I'm Jewish, so one of the things I, I give up on the Sabbath is social media. So I don't get on Facebook or Twitter. So I, I miss all of that, all that happened on August 9th. But on August 10th, we got the call that, oh, there was a prayer vigil. So we went there. That was the initial moment of being in it. And then I remember that the young people were out on the street and they said, hey, we're kind of done praying. We're, we're ready to take action. So, so they got in the street. I got in the street with the group of folks that joined them. And we sat in the street. They said they were going to take to the street in front of the police station for four and a half hours because that's how long Mike's body had laid in the street. And so at that moment, we were there and people were praying on the side of the, they were actually on the parking lot that has now become the police station. It was not built at that time. They were still building it. So I don't know. I, I think the structure might have been there, but in terms of it actually being open and being a jail and a police station, it was not at the time. The firehouse was built. So we were sitting on the street and everybody was just kind of figuring out what we're going to do next. And so somebody started sitting down for Michael Brown, sitting down for Michael Brown. And I was like, I got my drum in the car. I have a djembe. And so I went out and got the djembe in a chair and started playing. And just like that was this electricity that happened in the crowd. It was very interesting and wonderful. But that was the moment in which both me and the drum kind of got in the action of Ferguson. So to get started, um, we're going to ask you some questions about you and your participation. And we like to kind of um, uh, know kind of like, like what got you involved in the beginning? What do you remember about that? So I was uh, in Arizona when it first happened. I woke up, rolled over to check my timeline like everybody does, my Twitter timeline like everybody does in the morning. I'm, one of my homies from grade school was actually live tweeting from my window and the, the shooting, like, like, like he literally saw it happen. And at first, to be honest, I'm like, oh shit, that happens, you know, all the time in St. Louis. Stuff like this happens all the time. You know, I wonder what happened. They just gotta wait and see. You know, I just kept going on about my day and, and then within houses, I mean, within hours, like all of St. Louis is in Ferguson. I mean, this little bitty ass town that nobody really doesn't know. Well, nobody really mentions it at Ferguson. Everybody's off West Florissant, basically. And, and then hours later, the world then caught on. You know what I'm saying? So that's the start of how I got involved. And then when I, I immediately came home and the first thing I, I, I did was go see what was going on. And, and when, when I got messed up by the police, I've been out there ever since. That's how I got started. And are there any reasons you've encountered or heard or thought for why certain people maybe don't participate or can't participate? Watching the news. Watching too much of the goddamn news. Don't understand. Aren't educated enough on the issues, but, but they, they'll get there eventually. 
and not wanting to confront their own problematic bullshit, knowing that you have a very knowing, well, not knowing that you have a very patriarchal way of viewing things. And if you come out there on that front line, like some woman's going to check you on that shit. If you come out on some homophobic and you know it or don't know it, somebody straight or gay, straight or queer is going to check you on that shit. Transphobic, somebody trans or somebody that's cis is going to check you on that shit, whether you want it or not. So that's another reason why I don't think people come out because they don't want to feel like, well, they say that's divisive, but that's taken away from the real issue. We dying. We're dying because you're saying some homophobic, transphobic, sexist bullshit. It all plays into systemic racism, but it goes back to education and people will learn that eventually. But anyway, don't get me started. So this is the last question. What are some of the most memorable impressions of the movement? I would say the first couple of weeks, the smell was tear gas all the time, in your nose, every moment. You would go home, you would still smell it. You go to work, you smell it. You go back out there, you smell it. I think the anger was palpable. Like you could feel the anger and frustration. And I think most importantly, you felt the pain and you could hear the pain and what was happening. You could hear the pain of the people who were out there chanting, top of their lungs, no justice, no peace. I am Mike Brown. Like that meant something to people when we used to say that. A lot of times now people are like, well, you know, this ain't about Mike Brown. I'm like, no, but when we're out in there chanting, I am Mike Brown, it's about Mike Brown, because we believe that, and that could be any of us. It was like Mike on August 9th. It was Von Der Eric Myers on August, October 9th. So at any moment, it could be us. And so it was something to say, I am Mike Brown. So I wanted to just share with you these varying narratives that were shared um, with these students and with these kind of community um, participants who engaged in this conversation. And as you hear, right, they're, they're just, there's a tonality to the voices from the archive that um, just, just gives you a sense of not only vulnerability, but the kind of depth of observation, like the critical awareness and critical um, clarity that folks had as they talked about what was happening in these different spaces and what kind of uh, forged uh, activity and inactivity. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to, to share, I, I'm not gonna share this, this particular uh, narrative, but there was uh, many narratives that were collected that really showed us that the community was much more heterogeneous than was being portrayed. And so we, we saw so many queer and trans folks uh, who were there uh, in the midst of Ferguson. And some of you all know that, 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 that idea, right? That, that Ferguson was a queer, in many ways, a black queer trans um, movement. But there was something that was really said in one of the um, uh, narratives that I want to share, but I don't want to perform. And there was a moment when the police were gathering us and they would gather us all in kind of like these kind of like, uh, I don't know how to say it, except to say like uh, almost like rats in a cage, right? They push us all together. And a few of us were kind of taken, right? Uh, and, 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 and one of the people who was taken was a trans um, man who said that up until that point, he had never felt what it felt like to be a black man. And that just, I mean, like, I remember reading that from the transcripts and just weeping that this moment of coming into oneself, right, was a moment of violence, anti-Black violence, anti-Black gendered violence. So I'll stop there because I could say a lot more. I, I took a little bit of extra three minutes because I, I knew that we have the other panelists, so we'll say that's why. Um, but I thank you so much for allowing me to share um, the work that we're doing here. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, and as you'll see in the chat, Kali has just shared the link to the Documenting Ferguson project. So you can take a look at that. So we do have um, 
at least one, maybe a couple of questions in the chat. But I just wanted to again say thank you to all of the, the panelists, uh, Jenny, Skyla, John, and Jeffrey for sharing these incredible um, archival projects and experiences that you all have been working on and kind of dedicating so much of your efforts to. Um, I'll start by one of the questions um, that's in the chat. And this one is directed to John. And okay. it's uh, coming from Raquel. And she's curious to know what the response um, of your advisory committee was to the fact that so much of your dissertation was based on oral histories. Um, and she asked, were they receptive of your research method, having mostly oral histories as opposed to any accepted or established records related to your topic? And she's also thinking about the experience of Dr. Um, Deborah Gray Wright, who had challenges in utilizing the oral histories of enslaved women for her dissertation project. Well, uh, good question, but let me clarify one thing. I did do an, a lot of oral histories, but when I said almost none of my work was done in the archives, I didn't mean that I didn't work with documents. It's just that they were documents that were possessed by the people who created them. So I went to their houses to do the research rather than go to the UCLA library or, the, or something like that. Um, the, um, <laughs> I mean, this was 1974 or 75 when I got started. And I'll just give you two little anecdotes related to how my faculty responded. Um, when I went to the director of graduate studies office and the history department at Columbia to submit my dissertation proposal for this gay and lesbian history topic, he looked at it dropped it onto the desk and just looked at me and said, you know you'll never get another get a job, don't you? And I changed the subject immediately, but anyway. Um, but by contrast, I had tremendous support from my dissertation advisor. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary. I can remember going into his office really enthused that I was gonna do gay history. Uh, and you know, I said, oh, professor, I've, I, I know what my dissertation topic is gonna be. I'm gonna write a history of homosexuality in America. And his response was, John, I think you need to narrow your topic somewhat. <laughs> you know, he, he was very supportive all along the way. So, um, you know, within the immediate context of the faculty that I worked most closely with, I had good support actually. And I'm, have always remained thankful for that. Great, thank you, John, for that response. Can I just say one thing about that? Sure. Is that okay? Um, yeah. I'm just, I'm struck sometimes by uh, how uh, conservative the discipline of history can be and the way historiography becomes a particular form of um, sort of naming what is acceptable and, there, it's a theme that's run throughout our conversations in the last two days, um, but it's one that uh, I think is particularly complicated in the sense that history among many of the, um, among many of the humanities analytic traditions, so saving apart sort of fiction writing and literature, uh, the writing of literature, but in terms of analysis, history is one of the fields that is the most visible and read by publics that don't consider themselves to be part of, of the academy. And, and there's a way in which even how historians sort of function right now in the news or on in the, in the sort of ecosphere of political analysis. But there is something so profoundly conservative, and I don't mean that politically, I mean it um, methodologically and in terms of how, how we're encouraged to make the change studied in the, like change over time and not in fact to change the way we think about and produce history. So we don't have those spaces. And I actually think that it's one of the things that is for me most exciting about being in conversation with archivists is that you too, is my sense is you are also constrained by some of those things. But when we come together and start to think how we can push one another 
to sort of move beyond those boundaries and think about evidence in a different way, I think we really have a, there's something quite productive about that. But to just name um, how deeply conservative um, many of the fields that we were all trained, like US social history, the early origins of African American history, um, even women's, you know, women, women's history certainly falls under that category as well. Yes, absolutely, um, Jenny. And I'll just share a little bit. We have some other questions to get to, but I too am a historian um, from uh, graduated from the University of Chicago. But there's also a lot of conservatism around who is actually centered as the subject um of your dissertation so when i said i wanted to write a labor history that was told from the perspective of black women you know it's like people's minds explode they're like what do you mean how do you center a labor history that is typically known as a white male history from the vantage point of black women and what does that look like um and so i, I definitely understand you know your your thoughts about the conservatism of the field of history for sure we have another question uh, from Dan, and he his question is relevant to all of the panelists, but it concerns what Professor Breyer said about redaction and donors' wishes to control access to information about themselves. In particular, um, Dan fears that repositories might promise to honor these donors' requests, but keeping those promises can be difficult as a practical matter. And that's especially true after decades have passed and when the institutional memory of their promises fades. How would the panelists suggest we try to address that difficulty? Thank you for that excellent question, Dan. Um, I would really welcome hearing how other people answer it. Um, Marisa and I were having a conversation some about redaction yesterday um, after her beautiful talk. And um, we use redaction in the work of the Living Women's History Project to redact private information, so uh, addresses or phone numbers or social security numbers. Um, and so it's a sort of, and also recognizing that redaction is a function of the archive. So archives, archivists and, um, and archives redact information and so it's hard to know what's under there, right? Um, but one thing that we have um, developed in our time um, on this Living Women's History of HIV project is to share um, transcripts with narrators as the first step. So the, the narrators produce the uh, audio recording, we, we, we record the talk, and then we have it professionally transcribed. And then those transcriptions go back to the women. And they're read for... Um, they're read for uh, accuracy and for women who um, don't read well, we read them back the transcript. So actually then the transcript becomes re reanimated in the oral tradition. Um, but we ask them to mark the transcript in three ways and it is a relation, it is a question of redaction. We ask them to mark um, what cannot be shared beyond the interview transcript um, and then we actually um, redact that portion from both the audio and from the transcription. Um, what must be shared? So we ask them to affirm the content that must be shared. And then um, content that can be shared if we are so inclined. And that has really produced, um, I think for us, it's produced a very meaningful dialogue about what how women think about the parts of their lives that they want to have out in the world. Um, and uh, we, for this project where you hear the audio, we actually played back the audio for women so that they could hear what they sounded like as well as read what they said. Because I think that that's another important thing about, about that. And so everybody's consented to that. But the redact I mean, it's a huge issue. Like, I, I don't quite know how to deal with it. Um, and I'm lucky because I get to do it with people who are living. It's harder to do with people who aren't here. Who aren't alive. Yeah, I want to get in on that too, um, Jenny. I think that was um, well stated. And I think for, um, for the archive that we're building, one of the issues was that, of course, people are involved in various types of action. 
and some of that action by law might actually be problematic, right? So like if the police go to the, the Ferguson website, uh, the documented Ferguson website, they may see some things that, you know, they say, oh, that person is um, involved in X crime on the bridge that did X, right? Um, so one of the instructions that we gave the interviewee, interviewers uh, as they went out uh, when they were in training was that in the recording, if a person says, please don't, um, don't, don't do that, don't um, include this, right? That they noted in their transcription, the person said, don't include this. And actually what was said, we don't want to know. Right, so we 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 are not including this, right? Like, and, and that's a real. I mean, so that's that's so the original submission to the archive includes, we are not like like the words, please don't say this, and you see dot 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 dot, which it says we honored that person, right? Um, but there are a couple people who came back to us and said there were things that they said that they that they don't want included. And so what happened was the actual transcript then, we don't include their oral submission, right? We just opt out to not include their oral submission. And we just include the transcript and we just include, we block, we block out that redacted section. Because I, I, I do feel like that's important. I think that, you know, people say, oh, the integrity of the, you know, of the oral history and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait a minute. All, archival material has redaction. Even if I say everything that I think I want to say, there's, there is still redactive material, redacted material. And so for me, I feel like you're not losing integrity in honoring the folks with whom you're working, especially when they're sharing such vulnerable uh, information. And I'm wondering along these lines, is it because you are working with these kind of community-based archives of narratives where you're allowed to make those kind of decisions or take the license to do that in ways where um, Skyla had kind of referred to archives little a versus archives big A, you know, just operating in a community capacity and wanting to really um, honor the wishes of the folks who are a part of the project, is that something that's opened up in these different spaces? So we have uh, another question from Mark, uh, and he's wondering whether the panelists who are using digital methods might be able to talk about the issues of sustainability that Stacy was discussing um, earlier. How do people sustain them over time? Do they have a timeline? I was blown away by Stacy's presentation and what it meant to be called out to account for um, the, the physical and, um, and uh, climatic consequences of digital work. I, I had frankly never thought of it before and it, it really changed a lot of what I, I I'm still trying to process it. Um, but I will say that in my pre-hearing that talk phase, um, I've thought a lot about those questions. And, um, and uh, it is a very, it's very complicated. Because um, part of me is like, I want these, um, I want these things to live somewhere where it's not my responsibility to keep them up. Because that's not an acceptable, I, I mean, I'm not an archivist, but I know enough about what I don't know to know that I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, at the same time that, and maybe this is to your point, um, Marsha and Skyla, is that I do hold a little a archive in my project and I am the holder of it for now. Um, one of the ways that we have done it though is that um, we we make things out of the the archive that's been collected, and all of the women who are participants in the project receive those 
objects. So we've, we've self-produced a series of books. We make um, different kinds of, we take the excerpts that they say they must share and we put them into what we, we call a contact sheet, which is just a large sheet of paper that has all the quotes and we digitize all their photographs and make sure that they have all of those digital photographs, but also that they have printings of those photographs so that they have these things that they can show people uh, that, are, that are sort of like the compendium of all of their stories put together. But uh, I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure what a handoff looks like yet. And because it would have to be one that was really carefully um, because I didn't come to the project in the same way that Jeffrey did, which is was was charged with making this archive. I it just so happened that I th I think I said earlier like it's circumstantial, it's completely circumstantial. I wonder if there's a way we might also talk about university and institutional resources uh, needing to be. Um, uh increased um you know because uh the preservation of an archive often is given as the like the the 16th part of someone's portfolio <laughs> like right like it's like it's so like they don't have you know someone to do that work and so one of the things that was interesting about the ferguson document of ferguson was at some point we were like this can't be all about ferguson so actually what keeps it sustainable, unfortunately, is state violence, right? And so there's Ferguson, then there's this place, and then there's this place, and then there's Eric, and then there's, da -da -da, and then there's you know, Sandra Blanc, da -da 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 -da, right? So the state's violence actually is keeping this archive working. Right, which is which is a sick and queer in the in the in terms of like the most awkward, right? Um, and and in some ways um, um, ugly, right? Uh, reality of the work that we do, and so I don't have a a doubt that this archive particularly will continue, because I don't have a doubt that white supremacy will not continue to hold. Right? Like, I just don't have that um, faith. Uh, you know, in some ways, Eddie Glaude says it best, you know, um, there is a, fa a faction of, of, of this country that's, that's just irredeemable. It's not going to happen. Like, it's just not going to happen. And because they, they are insistent. And I think that, unfortunately, is the sad truth about some, some of our archives, right? The HIV AIDS, um, you know, I think about, um, you know, Quilting is a little bit different because I think the quilting practice actually, um, you know, modified over time, right? But there's a way in which some archives, like, like the Black Ace Project, for example, right? Like, it's not going to stop anytime soon, right? And so, so it has to continue. Um, but that is the kind of, you know. Um, Celeste Watkins Hayes, this idea that that is the work of the injuries of inequality, that it just, it, it's incessant. Yes, thank you. And there's a, a lot of um, agreement in the chat, seconding the need for universities to support preservation and also, you know, how state violence continues to sort of make a lot of these archives and narratives, they're going to keep coming, right? Um, as a result of that. But I'm wondering too, for John and Skyla, um, you're not necessarily working with archives that have a tie to any kind of university or larger entity. So how does that make you both think about the kind of sustainability of these, these archives and, and how you might try to address those issues? Um, well, um, yeah, I mean, when, when Jeffrey said resources, I immediately began thinking about this because like with Gerber Hart, for instance, um, it Hart, given the limited resources that it has, it doesn't really have a digital collection. It's the materials that it's collecting are still very paper oriented and there's no, they, we've managed to get some resources to digitize old LGBTQ periodicals, you know, to save them from the inevitable decay. 
uh, but really we're, we're operating on the margins. And there's, it's possible that over time, um, we could be losing some of the materials we have as and in addition to not collecting materials that we should have. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm still thinking this whole process through, you know, um, to be quite honest and, um, with developing, um, archive centers, you know, the thing that when we're moving from, you know, uh, the focus of preservation on physical materials, um, and thinking about, um, digital preservation, especially, you know, for those of us are in the position to, you know, have a little bit more time to consider like what the methodology is um, as we're developing, you know, policies uh, to support um, these collections. We have to think about like um, <laughs> kind of like what the end point is, which is something that a lot of us don't want to consider um, as archivists, as information professionals. And, you know, I have to round it back and uh, shout out um, Stacy. Uh, Stacey Williams, that is, again, um, who spoke this morning um, so profoundly about this topic and about the importance of really um, accepting onus uh, as, you know, institutions um, as it relates to what the connection and responsibilities are um, to the communities that while we're you know, really trying to think through how to preserve these materials, but then also thinking about like, again, what that endpoint is. And, you know, Stacey, um, you know, she makes you grapple with what that means uh, because um, she was the one who I first like, uh, became really cognizant of what it means to sunset a project. You know, and at first, like, you know, I, <laughs> um, in my mind, I kind of fought against it. Like, no, you know, we have to, you know, keep this going. And, you know, we're just in whatever number phase, not near like the ending of it. Um, but the truth of the matter is that everything is not made to last forever. Um, and I think that the more that we're able to really understand what that means, the better position we'll be able to contextualize that for you know, future users, future generations um, in a way that um, is safe, um, you know, um, for, of course, the contributors to the archives, but, you know, for the, for the archives themselves. Um, so again, you know, like I said, this is, this is me thinking through this process and what that means and also trying to develop policies, especially like in my current role, um, but to to develop policies to then um, to to support uh, to support that, and so I guess like more concretely, what that might mean is just having like you know a representation of a sampling of a particular collection, you know, which is what we do anyway when we digitize collections. We don't digitize the whole entire thing. So you know, a sampling of you know, like I mentioned, just mentioned, you know, like of the collection itself, and you know perhaps using that as a model and looking to um, other models of sustainability. And then also the, I guess the last point um, here is thinking about like what our networks are, who those folks are in the networks and bridging the information so that it doesn't all have to exist within one particular um, institution, you know, um, spreading the resources um, and, and just thinking about, you know, um, effective ways of, of, of doing that. Thank you, Skyla. And please do continue to put your uh, questions in the chat. Um, one of the things that, you know, all of you were kind of talking about in some ways how to activate collections. So there's the question of kind of preserving them so that they are able to kind of live on and be sustained. But I think all of us who are invested in archives are invested in collections and telling stories of marginalized people want to make sure that those stories those archives live on within the communities right that are represented in those narratives that are building those archives so for you and the different projects that you're working on what would it look like or what does it look like for those archives to live on in the community
Yeah, I, st I started to actually talk to Dave about something totally different. Um, but I felt like it was most appropriate uh, to talk about uh, anti-Black violence in Ferguson. But I actually was interested, like a few weeks ago, I got opportunity. I know this is going to people going like, oh my God, I can't believe you traveled in COVID. But, um, you know, I got the opportunity to go to Detroit uh, because I, I, I'm, I'm trying to finish this book. And uh, I had to make a choice and I was like, okay, I'm going to do all the right stuff. So I did all the right stuff. Okay, I got tested before, tested after. Okay, great, can't say that. But um, when I was in Detroit at the Charles Wright Museum, um, I came upon something that I was trying to look for inspiration um, for what I was doing. And I came upon um, a cowrie shell that was found um, um, on a slave ship. Um, and I did not understand like why I kept, I kept seeing all these cowrie shells, right? And this is gonna make sense in a minute, right? So like, in the 80s and 90s, cowrie shells was a big thing and, and folks would have probably been all over and like, oh my God, this is, you know, this is a great find. But what was happening to me was I was recalling my own kind of uh, fatu infatuation with cowrie shells in the 90s as a queer young man growing up in Chicago where this was a symbol of queerness, right? Right? And so that the way in which I got to know folks were gay was that they had the Kari shell bracelet on. I told my son this. I said, you know, I see if they, you didn't have the Kari shells around your neck or around your, around your wrist, you know, um, I didn't know if you were really gay or not, right? This is a thing in Black gay communities. But I had not connected what I'm writing about in this, in this disobedient reading books is, is the ways in which so much of the afterlife of slavery is, is about terror, right? Um, as we understand it, but what does it mean to actually think about the afterlife of slavery that includes pleasure, right? And that ultimately, particularly consensual sexual pleasure amongst queer Black folks. And so I was able to make this link and connection between my, right, like literally these folks in the 80s and 90s were saying, we were there too. But I didn't know that they were saying that until I came to the Charles Wright Museum and saw that cowrie shells were brought over from Africa as, as, as an adornment, right? So this was adornment material in the same way there was adornment, people, adornment for people in the 80s and 90s. So I said that to say that for me, these kinds of um, um, connections um, activate people's interest and engagement with archives. And this particular piece came from, um, shoot, I can't remember right now, uh, but it was a North Carolina, a North Carolina um, archival site and I now have to go to, to to employ that site right like that probably folks haven't visited in a long time you know like probably need some kind of um you know and so I'm gonna have to get some papers and I'm gonna fund it right and use university research research monies to do so right and this is the way in which I think we keep things going is by of course allowing our students to make these connections but also employing these archives and, and, and utilizing the resources and, and research that we have to do that work. So all that to say, this is how I'm thinking about it right now, sorry. Uh, one, thing that, one thing that I would say is like in terms of Gerber Hart, as I said, with our limited resources, we tend to operate on the principle of, oh, please come to us, we're happy to see you here. But it would be great for, there, if we had one or two people who could put together materials that could then travel to different community organizations, you know, for an evening or an afternoon or something to show people, whether it be flyers from announcing protest events or uh, the buttons that people wore on demonstrations uh, <clears throat> or old publications and things like that. It, that would be a way of bringing the archives to the community rather than being here for the community if you ever come. So it's, it's something for us to do that we don't do right now. Marcia, will you repeat the question if you don't mind? Sure, so um, I think it was actually my question. It was about what does it look like for um, these archives to live on within communities and to sort of be activated in those spaces? Okay. Um, so I think this is, 
it's 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 relevant but um i was thinking about i i believe it was last week like the month of october has been full <laughs> um but I was thinking about last week, I believe it was, and I was in conversation with um, educators who, um, uh, Dr. Emilio mentioned this program uh, as well, but the Chicago Metro History Fair. And, you know, right now I'm drawing a blank, probably because I'm on the spot, about um, what the theme <laughs> of the history fair was. But I mean, you know, we can all draw it together. You know, it's um, elementary and high school students uh, using, um, primary and secondary source materials to then inform what their, you know, projects are, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, um, when I was thinking about, you know, what I would talk to these educators about and like how to um, get them to like uh, encourage their students to use, um, you know, uh, archival collections and such, one of the first things that came to my mind is how, you know, a lot of us um, center ourselves within the work that we do and how, you know, that then informs our practices, um, et cetera. And so, and, and also thinking about like examples that have been given um, before and, um, and, you know, how like it, then begins to develop like a much more um, connected experience, right? And so, and it's just, the, the point that I'm getting to is thinking about like these younger people, thinking about, you know, like these, um, well, kids, I guess. I mean, I'm old enough to call them kids. So, you know, thinking about kids and, and them positioning themselves within their own history and how, you know, me personally, I think it's very important to live your own history and to understand that history is also current. It isn't just something that is of the past. And by like encouraging them to then place themselves within their own history, then they're making a connection to like, you know, what the information is that they're learning from, but also the fact that, you know, they very much so are a part of, of that as well. And, and so I guess like, more specifically, I'm thinking about, you know, how um, there's so much knowledge, because we talk a lot about institutional knowledge, right, as people who represent, like, institutions, but when you think about, like, um, the amount of information that is stored in a particular body, and so, you know, just thinking about families, and, you know, the amount of, like, rich, strong stories that could then, you know, like support the knowledge development of these young people, because then they learn that from gathering this information from like their relatives or people in their own communities, they begin to then link that to like the information that they're learning about, like in their history classes, or, you know, for those of them that I worked with um, through my um, uh, engagements with um, the Chicago Metro History Fair, but working with them in um, archives and helping them to then, you know, conduct like archival um, research, then, you know, through those experiences, they were then able to see that, okay, these things happened in these places with these people, but the stories that my grandmother told me were very similar to, you know, this information that I'm learning about in these particular narratives. And so in that way, you know, um, that, I, I guess, like, um, provides an example of how, you know, um, we're able to draw on a particular strength from, you know, um, how communities then, or community archives then supports, you know, the communities that, you know, they're created within, and how it's important for people within the community to have access to those archives. And so, you know, there's the part where you think about like what your roles and responsibilities are as, you know, an institutional archivist um, versus and or, you know, your role as a community archivist and, you know, how it's essential to play the part of, you know, allowing for engagement uh, with these materials and not, you know, being in a position to ward people off and away from these materials. And so, you know, um, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess my point is taken here. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank I you. love that question and that answer was so beautiful. Um, I guess I just wanted to say two quick things. One is, um, uh, you know, I think the, the, the emphasis on activating is really the most important part. And it, for me, is also a question of like, who gets to interpret the meaning of the archive? And so often, especially at this moment where 
we sort of live in a time when when everybody's encouraged to share their story and it focuses on your individual experience the work of interpretation then exists in some other realm and it's so clear to me that it's possible for people to do exactly what skyla is describing um, when they are when they actually are able to see what is in an archive and not just be something that's contributing to an archive so like you heard in the clip from Deborah and Marilyn, they're having a dialogue about, so the whole interview, these are women who've known each other for a long time, but have never, had, like they're talking about street corners, they're talking about particular experiences that they've had, and it's through that process that things are being produced. And it happened again when we would go back and work with women and they would read the quotes that were, um, somewhat separated from the name of the person who was saying it, not permanently, but just for that moment. And they would be like, did I say that? And someone would be like, no, I said that, you said this. And they started to see these links, but that's because they were able to activate what was there and not, um, and that didn't exist in, in the world of the historian, it existed in the world of the, of the narrator. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so we've got some more questions and comments here in the chat. Uh, and so Mark is asking, is print still the best way to at least imagine that archives would be permanent, whatever that is? So what are thoughts on, on print <laughs> materials? I, I'm too old to answer that question correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. I want to hear what your answer is. <laughs> well, all right. Well, I will say, I mean, it's, I've, I've only done research with, even when I've used oral histories, I've ended up reading transcripts of them rather in, in the archives rather than listening to them. I mean, you know, my whole life is connected to sort of print and paper. Um, and, and I wonder, you know, it's like I've had this discussion with archives, uh, you know, about my own materials. It's like, well, am I supposed to keep, create this whole series of flash drives that you'll get? And uh, I just, I just don't know. I mean, it's, um, I'm, you know, whereas, you know, a much younger generation is just so totally integrated into the technology of today that archives could comfortably mean something else for them in a way that for me, it's awkward. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I am too old. <laughs> I guess I would also distinguish between print and text. I don't necessarily think of them as the same thing. Um, I was sort of thinking about Kishana's talk this morning and her making the case for what parts of things get saved for her so, um, and what parts don't. And those are all text and, all of, and some of them could then be printed, but actually they're not the same thing. Um, and the other place that I find something interesting, and it was actually for me about as I'm watching the captioning again, is just from disability justice, understanding that the different ways people take in information is actually probably more important for us to be thinking about than um, any, than that sort of making sure that there are multiple ways for people to get into material and, and engage it and experience it, I think is probably part of it. And in that respect, print and text are similar, but not identical either. Thank you. Uh, we have another question and this one is for Jeffrey. Um, and uh, Avery is wondering whether the project is making um, since you were performing the the archives and the narratives, is the project making the recordings available or asking folks to perform their interviews? You're muted, Jeffrey. You're you're muted. I was I was really reflecting on the on the fact that I was being asked a question by Professor Gordon. I was like, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so so we we definitely in our protocols and interview um uh manual um agreement i'll say um have them sign off that they would be okay with performance right um that was the ethics of 
our um, our protocol. But um, but there were some folks who did not want their voices attached to their narrative. They were fine with the they were fine with the story being uh, being there on transcript, but they're not fine with their voices. And some of it was just idiosyncratic, like I don't like my voice, right? And then the other folks who were like, I am anonymous, but my voice is very distinctive. And if someone is listening to this and they know anything like the movement, they will know me, right? And so folks, um, folks didn't um, consent to that. Um, the performance of it, in some senses, for me, um, because I am a, a, a performance scholar too, I keep, sometimes forget that, but I was, I was trained in performance studies. And um, part of what I think is important is that there's things that text just can't do, right? It just doesn't pop off the page in the same way. The depth of emotion, the even just the very thoughtful pause, you just can't get just by dot, 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 right? Like, it's not like how thoughtful that pause was, you will never know, right? Like, was it one of those, like, they were crying and they were like thinking, or was it one of those, like, they just really were breathing into it and they were at a place of like real reflection. You don't get that. And, and unless you're going to add in performative, you know, um, uh, remarks, you're not going to get it, um, which is actually, I think, a style that could be very helpful as we continue to kind of take the text, right, and put it on the digital platform. What, would, what it would mean to actually narrate the breaths, the, you know, um, begins to cry, right? Um, laughs hysterically. But even that, like, laughs hysterically, the way I laugh hysterically can make you fall out, right? Like, like but the way other folks laugh hysterically might just be like continuous laugh. Um, so I think that there's, um, real um, questions about how the archive, what the archive can produce in terms of the totality of the person. And I think that, you know, I, I, to um, Skylar's point earlier, right, like I think there's some limitations and we just have to be good with some of the limitations. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I do love performance and particularly performing the archive. Thank you. A um, couple more, a few more questions and comments in the chat. So um, Cassandra has stated in relation to the discussion about sustainability for and with community networks, that it's essential to think in terms of facilitative and connective versus extractive and exploitative practices. For whom is the archive being produced and whom does the archive serve? Mm. Mm. Um, another comment as well about um, the Boulder County Latino History Project and the creation of lesson plans and primary source sets to sort of speak to Skyla's point um, about how community histories can be then be transmitted to subsequent generations. Um, any other questions or comments, please do place them in the chat. Right. So, an additional question I have is um, for those of you who are or have worked directly with donors um, and thinking about them donating their narratives or their physical items for a collection, what are some of the best practices that you engage in order to sort of maintain a respectful and equitable relationship? And I, I ask that because I think you all have in some way, shape or form kind of mentioned the degrees to which these narratives are not in the sort of institutional archives and that there are sort of silences and gaps in those narratives. And sometimes it's because the institutional archive is not looking. Um, sometimes it's because they have not represented those groups well in the past. And so there's a level of distrust. And so just wanting again to kind of think about what are some of the best practices and strategies. I know you've discussed some of them, but in working with community, how do you do that in ways that are equitable? Marsha, it would be great if you could tell us some of what 
what you do at the research consortium, I think that that would be a really helpful thing for folks to hear if you're willing to do it for a few, for a few minutes right now. Sure, um, definitely. So I'm executive director of the Black Metropolis Research Consortium. And um, the consortium is a membership association. It's a network of libraries, museums, um, universities, community arts organizations. And thanks to Skyla soon, uh, we will have our first um, representative institution from a government entity, Cook County um, Historic Archives and Records Office. So what connects all of these different institutions is that they have materials and holdings that reflect um, Black history and culture. Specifically, we focus on Chicago, but we have materials uh, in the member institutions that um, speak to the entire sort of African diaspora in certain ways. And so the BMRC was actually born out of, you know, this kind of concern about the dynamics between institutions, universities, researchers, and archives, right? And um, really a lot of the sort of lack of resources that had been poured into or utilized for archives relating to the Black experience in Chicago. And so the consortium has been about figuring out ways to kind of increase the collaborative nature, um, but also to do that in ways that are equitable. Um, and so we have embarked a lot around sort of legacy management resources to help people in the community know um, the value. They know, they know the value of their, their history, their legacy, their family and community stories, but we also want them to be able to engage in conversations with potential repositories or institutions and to know um, that they are doing so where that value is also recognized by the institution. Um, we do a lot to help our members think about the kind of practices that they're engaging in when they are talking with communities and wanting to acquire materials or even wanting to represent the materials that they already have. Um, so a lot of that work is thinking about how do you engage um, these histories, these narratives in ways that are respectful and interactive for both the institution as well as the sort of legacy holders. And then I just want to add, you know, or going back to the question, I think that it's important to um, be respectful to the creators um, and to the donors and to honor what their wishes are. Um, because in a lot of cases, um, they're not fully aware of, you know, what the agreement is um, between themselves and the institution that they've agreed um, to allow to be, you know, um, the caretakers of their materials. And I think that it's really important um, in those conversations to be as honest um, about, you know, what is, you know, what is happening um, with the transferring of, you know, those records, those materials, because they're not just materials, right? They're not just something that is static. You know, in a lot of cases, you know, these are, you know, folks is like um, lifetime works and it's emotional. And I think that, you know, we have to be respectful of all of what the relationship is um that is encompassed when you know we are taking on the responsibility as you know for custodial post custodial care um of their materials and you know and again that's going back to you know a lot of the points that we've made before that i've made as well in terms of thinking about like how we can then implement these inclusive and equitable um uh systems like within the policies that that we create and then you know for those of us who are working um under policies that were created before us but then like going back and challenging a lot of the language that exists you know um on behalf of the institution that you represent it isn't necessarily so that you then have to continuously um work from you know these particular like um templates that we're given um or you know we, we don't necessarily, especially um, for those of us who are in decision making um, or uh, who are uh, in decision making uh, at decision making, excuse me, capacities. I'm so fo focused on saying like the right word and a little bit more nervous in these settings, but that's here nor there. Um, but I, I do think that honestly that 
you know, that is where it happens. We have to give respect and focus on the aspect that of, of what it means to be, you know, like, or to engage in this person-centered approach, you know, um, as the archivist, because the bottom line is that we are the humans who are behind, you know, these systems. And so we have the ability to transform what these systems currently represent, especially if we don't, you know, especially if we're not aligned um, with them. And then in the place where we're then able to create you know, the policies, then we have to think about, like, how they are supportive of all of the people that, you know, we're looking to serve, right, of all of the narratives that, you know, we are wanting to be a part of what we're considering to be, like, this one historical record, right? Um, so, yeah, I just, I really have to, to place that there. And, you know, just with my own personal experiences of working with donors, really, that's where I started from. From a place of you know being genuine and from a place of thinking about like you know what the formal training was as well as like you know how i personally <laughs> wanted to dismantle some of those systems within you know those experiences related to my formal training and also how it didn't directly relate or connect to the work that i was doing like you know in the field um and in representing like you know the donors that were coming into these institutions that well i mean quite frankly we didn't discuss when I was in graduate school, right? Um, so, you know, that's just, you know, a little bit of food for thought and a bit, I guess, like to touch on like that response is, you know, putting, having like a more person-centered approach um, to lead the direction in which, you know, you'll allow for like how, you know, donors are represented um, in institutions and how their collections are also, you know, represented and preserved. Thank you. Any um, other kind of, we're nearing the end of the time for our session. So any other responses or kind of concluding thoughts from our wonderful, amazing, and very gracious panelists? I just wanted to say one thing about um, consent as a really important concept. Uh, and I was thinking about it a lot as I was listening to Skyla describe, there's some beautiful like amplifications in the chat, um, like the intimacy of archival work and radical and em empathy, and we're the humans behind these systems. Um, that uh, I think I learn, I, I think about this a lot as I, as I do um, work at, for about five years now with this group of, of women who are living with HIV. Um, we talk a lot about different, the different stages of consent and what it means for them to engage in a process of affirming and reconsenting to things. And the flip side of that is also being very clear when we get to the point where this will be the last time you, and you can always change your mind. You can, like it can live in a public forum and then the next time we come through, you know what, something's happened and I gotta take that out. Or something has changed, right? And so we're just pretty clear, like um, that's that's actually what we want people to we want people to have that power, and we also just need to know when when we're gonna be at a point where something's gonna become firm, and now you you won't be able to change your mind after this. But even just to be able to have that um, have that approach, I think we're trying to to do some of the things that, that um, Skyla is so beautiful, was so beautifully describing just before in her concept, in her, in her discussion of, um, of what that looks like and, and recognizing how we can change some systems. And, and for us, the main system that we're pushing against is the IRB, which defines things as very differently than we do. Um, and even just my own notions of consent coming out of like queer sexual cultures look so different than IRB. I mean, that, that, I guess that's a true statement if there ever was one. But, um, you know, I just think like that's an important thing to say out loud. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, there's one, we're at time, but I just wanted to acknowledge one final question that's come in from Christine. Um, and the conversation that we're just having uh, in the preceding moments. This makes me think about a conversation of imagining potential co-ownerships, custodianship by archives and institutions uh, of collections. Is anyone aware of changes of thinking about this in their institutions or projects? Is this a space to think about a person-centered approach? Okay. 
Great. Um, I guess I'll come, chime in. Sorry, since I'm going to wrap this up for our break. Um, I, I mean, like in my experience and what I've been hearing, I haven't heard anything like this. That's not to say that it isn't happening or people are not, you know, starting to think about, you know, new ways to, um, you know, my favorite uh, term from uh, Caribbean studies or post-colonial studies is reimagining. So I'm thinking that there are people who are, you know, sort of thinking about reimagining these relationships. And we've been talking about this in the profession for quite some time. Um, but, you know, when you're working for a traditional um, institution or an in institution that's attached to the state, um, that's going to be quite complicated. And from my keynote, this was one of the main points that I wanted people to understand from my keynote, which is the demographics of special collections, librarianship, and archives. You know, um, Black people are at 3%. And I think it could fluctuate, you know, in librarianship in general um, from a, a half a percentage point to a full percentage point. So it could be somewhere between, you know, 1.5 and 2% uh, African American uh, professionals who actually have positions in, um, in institutions, archival institutions or special collections libraries. So, um, and the numbers don't look that great for uh, indigenous professionals, um, Latino, Latina professionals, uh, Asian professionals across the board. So um, we can only do so much. Um, and that's the other thing about, you know, I've been trying to think about, uh, let's see what Raquel says there. You could come on the mic. There are a lot of comments coming in now. Um, mm -hmm. Feel free to come on the mic if you um, would like to, uh, but we're gonna head into break. But feel free to open up your microphone and, and um, make your comments because they're coming in fast. Okay, there are a lot of thank yous to the panelists. Um, go ahead, if you wanna wrap up, Marsha, with the panelists. Sure, so um, we can all give a virtual, and we can see each other, give a hand clap to our panelists, Jennifer Breyer, Skyla Hearn, John D'Amelio, and Jeffrey McCune. Thank you for being so generous with your insights and the projects that you're working on, and certainly on behalf of the folks who have contributed their narratives and their stories to your archives as well. Um, thank you all for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And thank you as well to Kali and Mark for organizing this um, wonderful panel and this amazing conference. Yes, and thank you all, thank you. Ma Marsha, thank you so much for moderating. This was, you made it such a wonderful session and thanks for all of your contributions to it. So UIC professor and uh, UIC professor in sociology, Atef Saeed, will do the introductions for Professor Avery Gordon. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, um, I was thought that this short intro was the quote, uh, beginning the quote. The focus of this book is a kind of consciousness I call being indifference and how it can be developed and sustained in practice. Being indifference is a political consciousness and a sincere knowledge, a standpoint, and a mindset for living on better terms than what we are offered, for living as if you had the necessity and the freedom to do so. By better, I mean a collective life without the misery, deadly inequalities, mutating racisms, social abandonment, endless war, police war, authoritarian governance, heteronormative oppositions, patriarchal rule, cultural conformity, and ecological destructions." End quote. These were a few words from the opening paragraphs of letters from the Utopian margin, the Hawthorne archives. I recall that two years ago, 
Briefly after this book was published, we read it in the space of the Institute for the Humanities at UIC as part of the reading group on race and empire. The group includes a wide range, range of interdisciplinary scholars, all work on anti-imperialism, abolition, critical race theory and critical theory, and all are in, invested in pushing the boundaries of rigid disciplinary disciplinarities and against static and repressive knowledges. When we read the book, all of us agreed. This represents so many things we aspire for and we wanted to do. As for the short passage above showed, and throughout this book, Professor Gordon telling us that she is committed to three things. First, to liber liberate political consciousness. Two, to contribute to the knowledge on epistemological emancipation. Or at least this is the way I interpret it, how Professor Gordon talks about indifference. As Dr. Gordon aims to trace the root of social difference, which is epistemological difference and issues of decolonizing epistemology. And third, she's also telling us that no liberation can happen without sensuous knowledge. The first time I met uh, Professor Gordon, and she wouldn't remember this, was in 2008. Briefly, at a, after a panel, a panel, she was sharing at the American Studies Association uh, annual meeting in Albuquerque. My friend, comrade, and inspirer, David Lloyd, introduced me to Dr. Gordon and told me, she's a sociologist like you. And she also doesn't like sociology, or at least the mainstream sociology, like you too. As a graduate student at the time, he was hanging out with interdisciplinary folks and loves history. I was heartened to know that such a thing does exist. You can be a sociologist and also work for emancipatory social sciences and humanistic research. After the quick meeting, the brief meeting in the hallway of the Albuquerque, one of those hotels, I went to look up her work online. I looked up ghostly matters and I learned that, quote, to study social life, one must confront the ghostly aspects of it, end quote. This is from the her also opening pages of Ghostly Matters. Over and over again in the book, Dr. Gordon was telling us that critical sociological imagination is the real infrastructure for social liberation. I can go on and on reading from Dr. Gordon's remarkable CV, but I will be short. And I know that all of us are eager to hear her talk, but briefly, let's say that Dr. Gordon's work blends together artistic work, themes of generosity, solidarity, torture, ending torture, emancipation, and utopia within and beyond the archives. Also engaging thoroughly with the work of Cedric Robinson, Stuart Hall, and organizing recently a book launch for Saidia Hartman, among others. And also to recently, that reflects how her investment on solidarity and generosity. Recently editing a special issue on the, with the title Life Work of Barbara Harlow for the journal Race and, and Class on 2019, where Professor Gordon also serves as one of the editorial uh, board of race and class. The title of the special issue is very telling, Solidarity Here and Everywhere. Dr. Gordon is consistently invested in pushing the boundaries of knowledge. So in addition to a great list of artistic exhibits and writing in different genres, Dr. Gordon contributes to many fields and disciplines such as history, sociology, American studies, literature, anthropology, Marxism and post-Marxism, critical theory, to name a few. I noticed that Dr. Gordon resume listed 19 arts projects or exhibitions across the globe where she was the main organizer or consultant or a collaborator. These are, there is no more evidence actually about a scholar in the social sciences who pushes the boundaries like this. 
for at least to my knowledge. I also spotted on uh, CV that in 1988, she presented a paper in ASA, our ASA, the Social Science, Sociology ASA, with the title of Ethnography as Fiction, Fiction as Social Science. All along, Professor Gordon has been invested in not only in emancipatory knowledge, but also exposing the limitations and the positivistic and racist social science. Professor Gordon was a professor of sociology at the University of California at Santa Barbara for 30 years. She is currently a visiting professor at Birkbeck School of Law, University of London. She's the author of the Hawthorne Archives, Letter from the Margin, Utopian Margin 2018, The Workhouse, Create a No Room with Ines Shaper 2015, Ghostly Matters, Hunting and the Sociological Imagination, published in two editions, one in 1997 and updated with a new preface in 2008, Keeping Good Time, Reflection on Knowledge, Power and the People, 2004, and Mapping Multiculturalism, 19. 97, among other books and articles. Her work focuses on radical thought and practice, and she writes about captivity, enslavement, war, and other forms of dispositions, and how to eliminate them. As I mentioned earlier, she serves on the editorial committee of the journal Recent Class, and she has been a co-host of New Elbies, a weekly public affairs radio program on KCSB FM Santa Barbara since 1997. She's a former keeper of Hawthorne Archive. Before I give the floor to Dr. Gordon, I would like to remind the participants to include and put their questions and comments into the chat rather than the Q&A. Now it's a, my great honor to introduce Professor Gordon, the keynote at the Different Archives, Different Histories Conference. The title of Professor Gordon's talk is Archives of Flights. Without further ado, please join me and welcome Professor Gordon, as I'm sure all of us are looking forward to listen to her keynote, as I do. Professor Gordon, the floor is yours. Good afternoon or good evening, since it's um, after 8 p.m. here in in London. Thank you, Atta, for that extraordinary introduction. I fear now I can only, I can only disappoint now. Um, I want to also thank um, Mark and Kobe for inviting me and Linda also for all her assistance in the organizational matters. I really enjoyed very much listening to um, all the um, speakers, all the participants over the last couple of days. I've learned so much and um, it's been very generative for me. So I thank you for that. And I feel a bit humbled actually following um, all of you. Um, now, I need to um, share my screen with you so I can get my PowerPoint going. So just give me a second to, to do that. All right, so um, Today in, um, in this talk, what I'd like to do is to describe the work of the Hawthorne Archive and to present some items from it. Um, as Aset mentioned, I recently left my job as keeper and published a selection of items held by the archive, letters, internal memos, reports, notes, conversations, images of various sorts under the title, The Hawthorne Archive Letters from the Utopian Margins. The Hawthorne Archive is named after the tree, not the American author. And it is not really a library or a research collection in the familiar sense in which many of you um, work, but is something else that I'm going to try to explain whether it should even be called an archive is perhaps open to to debate um, but we'll we'll see 
I think it's important to say right at the start that the Hawthorne Archive is a real place and also an imaginary one. And this makes it difficult to talk about because it involves moving between being inside its world and being outside of it, involves keeping with the um, involves keeping with the elements of its, its fabulations or its fictions and also standing outside of them to speak of it as a project to you in this context, a context in which, among other things, my role then comes to dominate and the collective enterprise is a little bit harder to get, get the measure of. The idea of the utopian margins is trying to get at this multiple world crossing and the book's form as a set of archive files makes it easier, I think, or I hope, to accept this moving between the real and the imaginary while, while reading the book. But especially for um, yeah, those of you who are just know nothing about this project whatsoever, I ask for your patience because you might find the whole business confusing and unsatisfying, particularly on the question of archives and archival practices, which is where I want to end up with it, where the Hawthorne archive is actually pretty lax. I'm going to try to briefly explain what's meant by the utopian margins, although here too I find the concept works best if it's a bit elusive and furtive even. Um, so hopefully I won't speak more than 40, 45, 45 minutes. The Hawthorne Archive gathers the utopian histories and practices of those who have long challenged the modern racial capitalist system, but whose challenges have been obscured, including by the history of the utopian itself. The archive houses, although it's not a proper library at all, an incomplete and disorganized intellectual history of a somewhat but not entirely random selection of radicals, fugitives, runaways, deserters, abolitionists, heretics, dreamers, and indifference, many tied to the black radical tradition, who at some point stopped doing what they were told they had to do, stopped doing what they were told they had to think, and stopped being available for things they had no design in making or controlling. The Hawthorne Archive is real, and it's also an imaginary infrastructure for a writing project that started off now quite some time ago with the purpose of finding some shared language for the utopian elements found in a variety of defiant activity in the past and in the present. The focus of the archive in the book that then is gathering some of its contents is a particular kind of political consciousness that as Atef read or mentioned, I call being indifference, and how this consciousness can be developed and sustained in practice. Being indifference is a political consciousness, and it is also a sensuous knowledge for, in effect, living in the acknowledgement that despite the overwhelming power of all the systems of domination that are trying to kill us, they don't completely control us. They're only one condition of our being. Being indifference is a practice that helps you be or become, as the writer Tony K. Bambara put it, and I quote her, unavailable for servitude, back stiff with conviction. The origins of the Hawthorne Archive, which is very old, is a long story for another occasion. The origins of my becoming its keeper began in the mid 1990s when I became interested in redefining utopian thinking, interested in defining what utopian thinking and practice has meant and could mean if, for example, slavery and prison abolition or the Jubilee anti-debt movement or the arising of the indigenous fourth world were examples of it. We were living through an important moment. Now we might see it as the start of a long cycle. We're still in a profound political, ontological, and epistemological opposition inaugurated by 
diverse peoples across the globe, the Zapatistas' first declaration from the La Condon jungle in January 1994, a flashpoint, opposition to a new phase of global capitalist expansion that has had many names, globalization, the new enclosures, the fourth world war against humanity, or neoliberalism. The right launched a counterinsurgency offensive to this wave of resistance that was ideologically encapsulated by Margaret Thatcher's famous diktat, there is no alternative, or later Francis Fukuyama's rather premature claim that history had ended. From the other side, too many radical intellectuals trivialize much of this opposition as, quote, merely utopian, that is not realistic or serious, and the cause of that managerial dismissal was precisely that this opposition was deeply engaged with movement politics and alternative life forms that had long been excluded from what the term utopian signified. There were then, and there are still, very good reasons to distrust and even dismiss the term utopian with its conventional meaning, which you all know, that future perfect, no place, imagined as a little nation, engineered by white middle-class reformers and peopled with homogeneous populations who don't have any conflicts or complicated psychological lives. In my view, the main problem, however, was not so much the terms idealism, ideas have enormous power, or the future perfect tense with its indication that something will have happened in the future that is over by the time we get there, as in we will have abolished policing by then. In my view, the main problem was the terms archive. It's deeply racialized historiography, a narrow set of literary, aesthetic, philosophical, historical, and sociological references. The Marxist dismissal of utopian socialism as nothing more than a kind of mishmash, as Engels put it, was only one intellectual origin point for a notion of the utopian that treated the genocidal settler colonialism that founded the so-called new world as a successful utopian enterprise, while absenting entirely what Peter Lindbaugh and Marcus Redeker call the many-headed hydra of the revolutionary 17th century Atlantic, that is, all those captives, slaves, maids, prisoners, pirates, sailors, heretics, indigenous peoples, deserters, commoners, and others who challenge the making of the modern capitalist world system. The utopian as we've come to know it includes the French and American revolutions, but not the Haitian revolution or the 30 year war waged by the black and red Seminoles against the United States or any subsequent fourth world refusals. It includes Karl Marx who absolutely hated the idea, but not Christian Priber, who you wouldn't have any reason to know who he was. He was a German socialist exile who joined the Cherokee Nation in 1736 and later died in prison because he refused to declare loyalty to the British. He was captured. The utopian as we know it includes the English craftsman William Morris, but not the African-American worker, the self-named Black Bolshevik Harry Haywood, includes the philosopher Ernst Bloch's philosophy of hope, but not the Caribbean writer and theorist C.L.R. James's philosophy of happiness. The utopian as we came to know it includes numerous white middle-class separatist communities in the US and Europe, but not one example of any instance of marinage in the entire Americas and so on. The examples are many. It was evident that there was an exclusionary zone of tremendous magnitude and that these exclusions define and haunt the history of the utopian and what it has and hasn't meant. The primary purpose of the Hawthorne Archive, however, is not really to critique this exclusionary zone and tally up what's missing. Rather, the purpose of the archive is to show something of what's in the space made invisible by the term's diagnostic frame. In other words, to show something of what's present in the blind field. There's always something or someone living and breathing in the place blinded from view. The question is what and who is there. There is another kind of utopianism in the blind field, although we 
almost never used the word utopian at the archive. This other utopianism, for lack of a better term, has distinct onto-epistemological affects and finds its historical roots precisely in that exclusionary zone, in slaves running away, in marinage, in piracy, heresy, vagrancy, vagabondage, rebellion, soldier desertion, and then other often illegible, illegitimate, or trivialized forms of escape, resistance, and alternative ways of life. This other utopianism lends to the term utopian a very different meaning, one rooted as equally in the past and the present as in the future, and it lends to the term a different notion of politics. This other utopianism produces temporary autonomous zones, to use Hakim Bey's term, that look less like the traditional rural separatist community and more like what sociologist Asaf Bayat calls the, quote, quiet encroachment of the world's urban poor, creating new life forms in the interstices of organized abandonment by the state. This other utopianism rejects individualization with its consumerism and, embra and embraces cooperation oriented towards what the collective Claire Fontaine means by the human strike. This other utopianism creates feral economies based on not working, as we know that activity as a means of exploitation, and that displace the productivist ethos most socialist traditions have favored. This other utopianism is characterized by both direct action against and non-participation in liberal democratic state politics and by various forms of what Leanne Simpson calls, quote, generative refusal, including boycotts, occupations, and mutual aid. This other utopianism gestures towards an alternate universe or an alternate civilization long in the making emerging out of and receding back into the shadows as needed, sometimes linking its very traditions and strands in solidarity and fellowship, sometimes badly internally broken. The Hawthorne archive is equally a mode of producing and a mode of representing, not so much the other utopianism as a scholarly object, but of what I started to call after the philosopher Ernst Bloch's idea, the utopian margins. So let me try to say a brief word about this idea. In his encyclopedic and somewhat mad scientist three volume work designed to create a philosophy of what his translators awkwardly call a quote, living theory practice of comprehended hope, Bloch declared, and I quote, all given existence and being itself has utopian margins which surround actuality with real and objective possibility. Consequently, he continued, every work which represents and informs this possibility is full of augmented horizon problems. Bloch is looking for a philosophical language for those utopian margins, or what he sometimes refers to as a utopian surplus or excess, and he's looking everywhere, in individual daydreams and in ordinary life, in literature, visual art, music, and popular culture, in political movements and theories, and in experimental or separatist societies and communities, hence three volumes. His search is fraught with what he calls horizon problems, Tensions between what's present and what's absent, what's past and future, and what's historically material and what's idealistically possible. Fraught also with how to be open to the possibilities active in those horizons or margins, which are in various states of what he calls unbecoming. These horizon problems result in part from the liminal nature of the possible. That's to say, some of what's possible is already here, has been summoned, to use Chemeranga Library's language, and some of it is a not yet or an anticipation coming from the past or the future. In the utopian margins, past, present, future, and not yet form a temporally discontinuous nonlinear historiography, as in 
the future can change the past, just as the past can lag behind it. For Bloch, this not yet or possibility is carried through time by something he calls red arrows and also by other kinds of ghostly forms such as drifting dreams or what Toni Morrison called rememories, those memories of places and events which are always waiting for you regardless of whether they belong to you or not. In this sense, the utopian margins can be a somewhat haunting and melancholy place. The animating spirits of those who came before in fight and flight and the drifting dreams of a better world are what Bloch called the quote, intractable blue. You get an idea here of the mad scientist language. The animating spirits of those who came before in flight and fight, flight and fight, and the drifting dreams of a better world flash and shine what is missing, the characteristic modality of a ghost, which may also account for why another philosopher, Herbert Marcuse, wrote that the historical alternatives which haunt the established society as subversive tendencies and forces were the proper domain of social theory. But Bloch, or Marcuse for that matter, doesn't leave it at that. Always, there's more here than meets the eye. The more leaving traces that produce the feeling, as Adorno put it, that something is really there or in the process of becoming. Or as Bloch would have it, in the utopian margins, things are simply other than they are. In the utopian margins, the truth of people and things is seen not from the perspective of what we're told is necessary and inevitable and really real, but from the perspective of the better we are capable of, what Bloch called in a beautiful phrase, the star of utopian destiny. And he meant this quite literally, as he wrote, quote, for more than 2000 years, the exploitation of man by man has been abolished in utopias. There, stupidity has lost its privileges and millions of people are not ruled, exploited and disinherited for thousands of years by a handful in the upper class. The majority, he continues, do not put up with being the damned of the earth, revolutions outnumber wars and succeed in abolishing rather than exchanging oppressors. No one is hungry, work is not compulsory, things are held in common and are distributed equally. As I say, idealism is not the problem. Although we are clearly haunted by the historical alternatives that could have been, and by the peculiar temporality of the shadowing of lost and better futures that insinuates itself in the present, the utopian margins are neither merely a lost past or an elusive future. The utopian margins are something else it's hard to describe, something more like a fugitive mode of living the what if, as if it were the dominant reality. The utopian margins are a liminal place, perhaps it would be appropriate to say a queer place, where delicate and difficult crossings, transformations, and transfigurations take place. For the utopian margins are not only where we can see that things are other than they are, see the accumulation of collective intelligence gathered from struggle that resides therein. It is also where we become something other than we were, where we develop new forms of life, where we grow what Herbert Marcuse provocatively called organs for the alternative. The Hawthorne Archive sends and receives letters from the utopian margins. Or perhaps it's more accurate to say that the Hawthorne Archive is situated on or in the utopian margins. Or the Hawthorne Archive is part of a rich utopian surplus that exists in the past, present, not yet, and future perfect. We tend to think of the archive as a repository of memories, objects, and documents from the past or as a name for a body of knowledge and information, or as a technique 
that represents or transforms events, institutions, biographies, information, social processes, and so on, into a set of objects, documents, and records, sometimes accessible for view and study, sometimes kept secret or highly restricted, sometimes for good reason kept secret, as people talked about over the last day and a half. So what kind of archive is the Hawthorne archive exactly? What kind of archive safeguards or keeps company with or summons a past that the present hasn't yet caught up with in order to haunt the present as an alternative? What kind of archive is somehow at the crossroads of parallel universes in a constellation of stars of utopian destiny in which messages are carried across time and space by red arrows, drifting dreams, by possibly terrifying rememories, and if Sun Ra was right, by his outer space music. What is the term archive even doing here? Too much and not enough. And so maybe it's better now to speak much more plainly and only about my own motivations. For a long time, my intellectual work has involved looking for a respectful vocabulary or language for the subjugated knowledge of slaves, prisoners, runaways, war deserters, and other fugitives and troublemakers, most of whom have left few written records of their own making, or if alive or difficult to meet with face to face. They are usually, as Kali said yesterday, and I quote her, archival conscripts. This subjugated knowledge speaks its own language and is to quote Aimé Césaire, born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. This subjugated knowledge is necessarily fragmentary and requires a certain degree of invention to put into writing, writing that's to be shared publicly at any rate, requires a method or a practice or a form that can carry the traces of the history that dismissed the knowledge in the first place forward towards something else, something outside of or intrinsic, extrinsic to the mode of production through which it appears to us primarily as marginalized and fugitive. So that's a bit of a mouthful, let me say that again. Requires a, a method or a form that can carry the traces of the history that dismiss the knowledge in the first place forward towards something else, something outside of or extrinsic to the mode of production through which it appears to us primarily as marginalized and fugitive. The question of writing and representation has always been paramount for me and still is. I've wanted to develop a writing practice that could make common cause with the people whose faith the writing chronicles, a writing practice that could acknowledge the mode of production of the writing itself, and a writing practice that could also animate what had been lost, repressed, or trivialized. The question of what is the right form for a given story or project is a question I've felt has to be asked and answered anew with each, within the limits set, of course, by my abilities and resources, and to some extent the audience for the work, which is one reason I found it hard to fit in a discipline, not the only reason. Taf and I can talk more about sociology. In this book, the writing is neither fiction nor traditional scholarly writing as we know it, although it's based in both. The book consists not of ordinary chapters, but of annotated files organized in four sections or four collections. For those of you who haven't read the book, I'd like to take a moment to briefly describe the thematic core of the four sections so as to make the archive more concrete for you. For those of you who have read the book, please just maybe take a short break and come back in a second. Okay. The first section is entitled The Scandal of the Qualitative Difference, and it takes its name from a phrase Herbert Marcuse used, the qualitative difference, to capture the nature of the deep systematic change he associated with liberation, what he called the great refusal, and with the development of those provocatively named organs for the alternative. The importance to the archive of this idea of the qualitative difference and Tony K. Bambara's abolitionist notion 
of becoming unavailable for servitude is clear throughout all the life of the archive. But this section includes a little bit of background history on the archive itself, a set of reports subsequently abandoned on the concept of the utopian, and a lengthy correspondence and set of conversations with C, um, including a report she made at our behest around the time that over one million people occupied Tahir Square in its surrounding streets, a page of which you see here. The second section takes its name, a means of preparation, from the description that Cedric Robinson gave of the source of the Black radical tradition as he understood it. He wrote, and I quote, in the daily encounters and petty resistances to domination, slaves had acquired a sense of the calculus of oppression and its overt or organization. These experiences lent themselves to a means of preparation for more epic resistance movements. This coll collection elaborates on preparation as a name for the practical means by which intelligence and organization are collectively mobilized to avoid and abolish various forms of enslavement and enclosure. The thematic core is various instances of flight from slavery, from capitalism, from war, from state repression. There are some reports for internal use on soldier desertion, for example, as well as the materials loaned by the Hawthorne Archive to the Museum of Non-Participation about the fugitive slave woman Eliza Winston, a deposit to the archive by the artist Sarah Bennington of props and other things for her film, The Logic of the Birds. I showed you the binoculars earlier, and a completely jumbled file about the brief period of Dutch colonization in northeastern Brazil under the governorship of Johan Maritz. The third section is entitled The Exile of Our Longing and comes from a phrase used by the law professor Patricia Williams. It revisits some questions about haunting and futurity in the context which preoccupy the members of the archive, the occupation of Palestine, colonialism, imprisonment, the war on terror, and refugees fleeing war. This collection presents a number of shorter fragmented items, several hurried replies to requests made to the archive for one thing or another, and two files that deal with psychiatric problems or problems caused by psychiatrists one treating the effects of the occupation of Palestine as an instance of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, problem with the P there, the post, and the other on the invention and application of the thematic apperception test, it's a personality test in the US and in the Congo, and the latter um, about the APT um, test, you see images of, of here. Finally, the fourth section takes its title, Perception of the Subjectivity of the So-Called Object, from a statement made by Anselm Franca that accompanied his request to explain who Leon Shugas was, the young anarchist and steelworker who killed um, the U.S. President McKinley, and why Thomas Edison made a film about his execution by electrocution at Sing Sing Prison in 1901. That statement read, I quote, what happens if the term animism is no longer used as an ethnographic category, but is turned on to Western modernity itself? The concept then opens up a very different set of problems at the core of which lies not subjectivity of perception, but perception of the subjectivity of the so-called object. This section includes a wide variety of items that focus on prisoners and those confined by the state, whether prisoners of war or so-called ordinary criminals or the range of people who were sent to the workhouses from the 16th to the 19th centuries. It also includes a set of drawings deposited by Iranian artist and active archive member, Natasha Sadr Hagigian, one of which you see here. So, as you can see, 
The book itself mimes the archive format in its composition, organization, and design. Why? Well, the simplest answer to this question of why the book takes the form it does is because I was stepping down as the keeper of the archive and after some discussion, we decided it would be useful to produce a selection of items for publication. The form of the book is self-evident in this context, although it gives an impression of the archive's orderliness, which is an artifact of editing and thus misleading. Another way to say this is that the book consists of an assembly of letters, documents, images, file notes, and so on, because that is the form in which most archives exist. And the argument of the book, which is embedded in the existence of the Hawthorne archive, is made through the infrastructure of that form. The book's material assembly, the layout, the writing, the images, can't really be avoided. If you only want to read the argument or skim the points or gather the stories or just look at the pictures, you still have to make your way through its mode of production, through the files and the file notes, through the various modes of classification and framing, through the non-bureaucratic bureaucratic language that's delivered with that certain wink and a nod, a certain degree of humor. In other words, the book forces you to read it as an artifact, as the kind of thing that might itself be an item in an archive. The book's archival form reflects a couple of other considerations worth mentioning. First, it is not a novel or a book of short stories or a book length poem. The writing can be poetic in places and the book certainly traffics in fiction and fabulation. One might even suggest that the Hawthorne archive is a fiction, a fiction of a particular alternative civilization and this distinguishes it from conventional archives, even radical or community ones. But it is adamantly not a work of fiction, like for example, Raymond Williams's two volume, People of the Black Mountains, which tells the story of a young man searching for his missing grandfather in the mountains, who hears and then recounts the voices of his ancestors, of also old places, historical battles for freedom and so on, a novel that's deeply rooted in and designed to make visible a lost archive of Welsh radical history for a political present that needed it. Neither is it a work of fiction like Alexis Pauling Gum's The M Archive, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, a far more experimental and poetic work, also written with her political present in mind, in which a surviving researcher or post-scientist, as they're called, is sorting artifacts, quote, after the end of the world, that's the book subtitle, as if they were the only survivors. So neither of those forms, really. In a book she's writing now, Anne Svektovich helpfully distinguishes among archive, counter archive, absent archive, and recovered archive. She broadly opened up the possibilities for understanding the terms of engagement around the notion of archive or the archive, and to register the complicated relationship between the archive as place and the archive as method and between the archive as technique of state power and the archive as a means of reparation and transformation. All the issues um, this conference has been addressing um, deeply for, for the past two days. The Hawthorne Archive as a project has essentially parsed the difference between archive as method and archive as place in order to simultaneously, one, keep the tension between fact and fiction operative and also playful to, as the artist Mariam Shafri put it, to quote, open up a fantastical space where imprecision, ambiguity, and contradiction, the very things that the natural or social sciences avoid, come into play. So one, to keep that tension between fact and fiction operative, but also, as I say, a bit playful. Two, to be reflexive, self-aware about the mode of production of the knowledge that I am creating. And three, to show rather than only tell something about political consciousness in action now, where now the present is embedded 
in the nonlinear historiography and temporality of the utopian margins. For me, writing about political consciousness in action in its present tense, regardless of whether it happened in the past or is happening now or happened in the future, means less my speculating as the scholar on the outside about what people we don't have records for might have been thinking or feeling or saying to each other, and more speculation narrated as conjunctural analysis from within a world, both real and fictional, in which I am a participant. That is, well, how are folks mapping the socioeconomic and geopolitical coordinates of a present moment that emerged historically? How are they, or we, taking the measure of what its tendencies are, where it might drift and be pushed? How are they understanding and acting on the political possibilities and threats that are thrown up by a given moment of, of crisis? This is a different kind of speculation that aims to narrate, to put it somewhat coldly, a consciousness in political culture as lived, or to use Raymond Williams's term, to narrate the structure of feeling of political consciousness in situ. To repeat, the Hawthorne archive is a hospitable environment for thought, conversation, writing, invention, friendship, political conspiracy, and for things being just other than they are. It's really not an archive in any ordinary sense or as a project principally concerned with or about the archive as a place or as a mode of knowledge production. In its own world, that's very clear. It has collections, but much else or other, including a system of refuge. It's something different than what we normally take an archive to be. In fact, many of us agree that it's poorly named, and we are still trying to locate who exactly was responsible for adding the early 17th century word archive to what was more likely to have been the Hawthorne recorder as that term carried the old meaning of bringing to remembrance from the heart through memory and story. It's also possible that Hawthorne was never meant to be a proper name as such, but was rather a direction or misdirection for a secret meeting by the Hawthorne Grove later tonight, or ingredients for a recipe, two branches with adequate leaves and ripe berries for healing a broken heart or protecting the border to the world of the dead. In any event, the Hawthorne archive holds as dear a particular kind of evidence, not merely documents or material objects, but evidence of a different way of being. This is key. The utopian margins are a mode of living. In this sense, the archive apparatus, the letters and file notes and internal memos, etc., is a tool one means for conveying a larger collectivity and a larger ongoing process bound by public and private relationships. It is a means for conveying an image of a community of intellectuals, artists, writers, and activists working and living in difference, of not waiting for another world, but of already being there. Being there is problematized in many ways in the book, including through the archive apparatus itself. The archive apparatus then is only an attempt, perhaps a poor one, to convey a sense of other occasions, of conversations and solidarities unfolding and finished, points and lines and relationships to be developed going here and there, crossing worlds where we are, as James Baldwin used to say, just better than what they think we are. As I, as I mentioned, I stepped down as keeper, and now someone um, met, who goes by the initial E has that role. As it turns out, the new keeper may not stay for very long. They enjoy welcoming new arrivals, coordinating with various friends and collaborators, and con conducting clandestine operations, but they don't like answering the kind of queries we often receive. E now routinely forwards them to me, accompanied by exas 
exasperated letters. And I received, re received one back in January that began this way. Dear A, that's me. An acquaintance of the archive sent a copy of a blurry painting by J.M. Turner from 1835 entitled A Disaster at Sea. It's not the famous one, as far as I can tell. This one seems to concern a convict transport ship. They are interested in rebellions, mutinies, and escapes aboard the slavers and the convict transport ships, and they want to know if we have any relevant information about this painting and the story behind it. Okay, and now for the exasperated bit. This is from E. Really, how do you have time for this stuff? Capitalism lurches from crisis to crisis, their political systems are bankrupt, and they kept, keep spending more and more money on war, on police, and on border control. Armed white militias are terrorizing us like it was 1915. The elites in the West seem to be in a complete denial about the decline of Western civilization and are still not listening to a word the First Nation peoples have said for centuries. We're facing ecological catastrophe, and of course, since he wrote the letter in January, the COVID exposed crisis and care and social reproduction, so you can add that to her list of frustration. They continue, as more folks get shut out, see the sustainability of the earth failing, they are looking for real alternatives. All the rebellions and the ongoing opposition send a lot more people our way. Organizing mutual aid, water systems, new farms, solidarity, fellowship, this is what we need right now, along with coordinated escape routes and stepping up the plan to foment desertion, mutiny, and insubordination among the army and the police. I am busy with the great turning of the wheel. There's a big exclamation point there. I can't be in the library right now investing, investigating this kind of old thing. If you could answer, I'd appreciate it. I think you know something about the early prisoner trade. In any event, it would be great if you'd consider taking your job back. It's not for me, as always, E my initial uh, reply. We're getting to the end. <clears throat> Dear E, no worries, you keep the great wheel turning. Not sure about returning to the old job, but here's a quick reply to your question. I will send a longer letter about both the painting and the case it refers to when I can get to it. You are correct. A disaster at sea is not the famous Turner painting. That 1840 painting, slavers overthrowing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming on, no now is the slave ship, was made in response to publicity over the deaths of 150 African captives on the slaver the Zong in 1781. It is part of a long history of abolitionist attention to what happened on the ship and the subsequent court case. More on this if you're interested to come. Disaster at Sea was made five years earlier and neither became famous nor part of an organized political campaign and then tradition of radical writing. The 1835 painting was made in response to the wreck of the Amphitrite off the coast of France in Boulogne, south of Calais on August 31st, 1833 during a days long violent storm. The ship was a transport and like the earlier slavers, privately owned, it was a transport taking 108 women prisoners and a dozen of their children to New South Wales to serve their sentences as unpaid servants. Everyone on that ship, with the exception of three members of the crew, drowned. The wreck was widely reported at the time because John Wilkes, Paris, Car Paris correspondent of the London paper, the evening paper, The Standard, was in Boulogne then and witnessed the events reporting immediately on it, followed by the Times. Though the deaths of the women prisoners are not remembered today, there was a government report at the time and the incident was also raised in the Commons, where Lord Palmerston, the Foreign Secretary, had to answer questions demanded in a petition drawn up by English residents of Boulogne regarding a number of issues, almost none of which concerned the system of convict labor known euphemistically as transportation. Everyone save three 
133 persons in total drowned on that ship because the captain, John Hunter, in consultation with James Forrester, the surgeon superintendent, first refused to abandon the ship and head for shore before the high tides came in, which did indeed smash the ship to pieces when they did, and then later refused to accept any of the quite heroic assistance offered by local French pilots and fishermen to rescue the passengers on the ship. According to John Owen, one of the surviving crew, the captain made it clear that his orders were to land the women in New South Wales, not France, and that if they were to come ashore in France, they would surely escape, and he and Forrester would be held responsible. The names of the women on that ship are in the National Archives, and various county record offices hold the documents from their court cases, such as those cases were. The women were all sentenced to unpaid servitude, their employers required only to feed and house them. Anne Rogers, a cook, 20 years for stealing three pots of jam and an unspecified number of cakes, all of which she herself had made. Jane Huptain, a prostitute sentenced to death for solicitation, I should just say transportation like the earlier banishment out of which it emerged as punishment was considered a commutation of the death sentence, as was the case with enslavement in the main. Should Jane have returned to England and been caught, she would have been executed. She found company with three other sex workers from Worcestershire, Ellen Bingham, Sophia Goff, and Hannah Tart. There was a young Welsh girl, Anna Lewis, and at least 17 older Scottish women, the leaders of any escape plan, I'd imagine. I will send more on the women later, too. 136, 133 people died, including the captain and the surgeon, to ensure that 103 women and 12 of their children did not escape. The women didn't need to organize a rebellion or make an elaborate plan for flight or arrange for return to Glasgow or arrange a forward journey to a new place some of them could live in together. They didn't need to recruit friendly members of the crew to assist them in any of those plans, and the crew didn't even need to think of mutiny. All this the captain had already carefully considered, and in a paradigmatic act of counterinsurgency, chose the necro-political solution. Not even the economic factor, these women were expected to supply no-cost labor for settlement, and he certainly would expect a reckoning on that score, not to mention the difficulty of finding workers for this shipwork. Not even the economic factor weakened his singular resolve to prevent any escape, any deviation from his orders. There's more, but for now I will just say that regardless of whether the Amphitrite was a scene of flight, its story belongs in our abolition archive because the captain's logic and the terms of order in which its clarity and madness are embedded is what abolition aims to abolish in whatever form it takes. As always, A. Thank you. We will expecting Qs and As. Wait a minute. I think for um, people who are panelists, maybe we can just um, unmute and ask questions. Um, and I can actually start things out. Um, thank you so much, Avery, for the stimulating and imaginative and beautiful um, talk. Um, I'm wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about form a little bit more and reflect on um, the meaning of form for you, because um, for folks who are tuned in, who love to talk about these issues from a literary perspective, 
<laughs> it's one of the things that is so interesting about your work in the Hawthorne archive and also particularly in this talk. And um, you use that form, the, that word form a couple of times. And um, I was wondering maybe if you could reflect on the kind of work that that word does for you um, in giving shape to the voices, the narratives, the testimony, the, the, the various um, uh, objects, I guess, or um, discourses that are being gathered together in this way of thinking. And to what extent does that form I mean, where does the form come from, I guess? And what are its implications for organizing into future action? Um, because I, when you use that word, I think of it, you know, that it's a word that sometimes comes into institution building. It comes into community building. It comes into lots of ways of thinking about the, you know, coalition building and so on, but it, but um, when you're talking about the archive um, and the use of form to arrange elements, I wonder, as you're speaking, to what extent does that enable new forms of agency? To what extent is that, are you interested in committing to new forms of agency, or is it mostly um, just a possibility of um, of building those coalitions? Anyway, that that's maybe speaking a little bit about the form and what form does. Um, okay, let me um, let me try to take it um, the more simply from from the top and then see if I can understand what you mean by new forms of agency. So I'll just answer it in the more simple way I'm understanding the question at, at the top of it. Where does the form come from? Um, so um, one of the things that genres do, including um, if we think of academic disciplines as genres, is that they provide ready-made forms in the sense that we learn methods and protocols and there's a, a sort of more generic academic form of writing in which there's, there's some variation between what would be the norm, for example, for Ataf and, and I in sociology versus literary history in your case or chemistry. Um, but there's those disciplines provide protocols by which we learn how to ask a question, answer it, and present those results. And so there is a ready-made form, and there's, there's some room for creativity and individuality in that, but there, but there is more or less a form. And, and that form makes life easier to some extent because it, means that you don't have to create a form. You use the form that is given through, through your training, through your intellectual, professional interlocutors and communities and so on. And most people work in that, that way. And, it, and that's, you know, and then we have um, this idea of interdisciplinary work. And some of that is additive. And some of that produces whole fields of knowledge that then have their own protocols and, and so on. So for me, one of the things for me, and it m might have been just because of starting in a field like sociology, the available forms were just completely impossible for what I was interested in um, in writing about and um, and conveying as what exists in the social world. So 
if your if your mandate is to try to somehow represent that what how do you do that and for most sociologists that's just it's just not a question they don't care about that that's a problem for for fiction writers or that's a problem for tv producers or something like that so so that's part of what i mean by form literally for me is i was trying to find a way to um to both if you like do the research but also find a way of communicating writing that wasn't completely anyway that was just trying to find a hybrid form for it so that's um you know so where does it come from um you know i'd like to say that it comes entirely from what the what the answer demands <laughs> so you know if you want to convey haunting you want a form that can convey haunting so but i i think that's that's some not entirely true because obviously the form of that book is still very scholarly i mean i mean there's the the forms are made up of given available ways of doing things and it's part of the reason why i said it's not an why this the hawthorne archive and the for me an issue that doesn't seem to matter to anyone else but me saying that it is not a novel it is not fiction it doesn't take that form because I mean, this is a question that we haven't we haven't really talked about at the conference, but I think it's a really interesting one, which is um, at what point does um, invention lead to a responsibility to write fiction as opposed to invent and play around with documents that have a responsibility to people who exist and so you know the i i think that that's a question as we move much more into people playing with the archive and playing with the historical material and speculating on it and inventing around it and not saying i'm writing a novel or you know um writing poetry or something like that there, that those questions emerge and I, I so and that that's partially I mean by four of those kind of maybe not so interesting genre questions that I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking me about new forms of agency or action so I need you to say a little bit more about just say a little bit more on that well what you're already seeing is really helpful um and I I guess um that maybe you're already answering what i was wondering about which is that um maybe would it be right to say that your approach is encouraging new forms of communicability um that when you talk about um, new forms of communicability and communication and um, and collaboration that could enable various kinds of political action, even while um, your approach isn't itself the recommendation right. for any particular political action. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's not, I'm not so much saying that here I've got the answer, follow this form. If you follow this form, you get, you, you go down the yellow brick road. No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, I think that there's, there is and should be a lot of rich variation in how, um, I mean, the disciplines are to some extent, on the one hand, um, useful, ways in which we organize intellectual production and on the other hand they are cancers i mean they're just awful you know that that the world is divided and carved up and we're slotted into these um you know um boxes these categories that doesn't reflect anything about how the actual world works and then 
anyone who's then people are sort of having to either see to them or push against them. And I think it, it's, it makes it very difficult to um, imagine other ways in which we could be producing knowledge and what it might look like that don't quite fit into the genres we, we have. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm open to, I mean, I'm really interested in all the ways in which people can do this creatively. Um, but, Thank yeah. you. I have your mic is off. Yes, yes I, I, I'm unmuted myself. <laughs> I have a quick comment and two questions, and actually some question in the Q&A resonates, but I will read it in a second. But I will start with my quick comment is that I'm intrigued by, and it's my apologies first that I missed the conference and I have been meaning to be there and I could not, but maybe some of these things were answered. I was intrigued by all the typologies of archives that you mentioned, and maybe this is a narrow-minded sociological, um, historical sociologist in me about the recorded archive, the silenced archives, and all these typologies that you mentioned in the talk. And it's for me, and I, I thought when we were reading the book and in your talk about there is lots of flexibility and maneuvering, like a rhetorical moves about, and also in the book about this is a real archive and imaginative archives. So I would love if you elaborate more about these multiplicities mm -hmm. and archive as a method and as a space, as you mentioned too. Um, so that's the comment. The two questions are general about the margin of the, the utopian, utopian margin notion, right? And um, it, it invoked to me multiplicities of utopias. Also, again, the, 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 the narrow-minded sociological thinking about are there multiplicities or real or counter utopias or alternative utopias, why we're not using this terminology vis-a-vis -vis margin, you know, because we're acknowledging the existing of the dominant utopias or the racist utopias or the colonial imperial utopias, because as the archives in the end of the day they are state-made, imperial-made, and so forth. So I want to hear more. You, you help us think about how you what, what these multiplicities of utopias or the margin notion and uh, the third is the and this is really fascinating for me as uh, the, the the historical sociologist and me about uh, thinking about the past and present and future like the documents in the book are really fascinating tour historical tour of fugitives revolutions, lots of things across history, and, uh, and it's utopia existed in the past, and it's so silenced, and it's also in the present, and it's also about the utopia in the future. So really, it's where, like, I, I want to, and I love this bridging. I'm not crit criticizing the, the bridging. I love this, that utopia is a, is a political consciousness, as you're saying. So I want to hear more about this utopia as bridging um, history without violating history, uh, if you might. So I will read a question from uh, Jeffrey McCune. It resonates to the, the same point about the utopic margin I, I'm reading. This notion of utopian margin is very interesting. I'm wondering if a dystopian margins may better articulate the kinds of fugitive marks marginal folks make in the literal sea of dispossessions. Perhaps I'm misunderstanding utopic margin here, but I find some utility in marginal performance, a rehearsal in a space of liminality, which may make the foresee on how black and indigenous folks may mark an impossibility of utopia. And uh, Jeffrey uh, McKeon also adds, what do you say to these concerns? Or perhaps you addressed this already. And I have a couple other questions, but maybe we'll give Professor Gordon a chance to first to respond, okay. to respond to these um, I will see if I can if I can um, respond to all these um, uh, very sophisticated comments so let me just let me just say one thing and maybe this is also um, 
possibly getting at, at Jeffrey's um, point in question as well. Um, one of the things that um, that I'm just you're just going to hear a certain reluctance on my part. Utopian margins, disutopian margins. I mean, part of what the the Hawthorne archive for me, I hope, does is to displace the um, conventional framework of how we have understood the utopian. I mean, I am actually not at all invested in that. It was an effort to, and that's why when you actually look at how the collections proceed, how the book proceeds, there is a kind of logic to it, even though you can come read whatever collection you're, you're interested in. Um, but to actually um, see a movement in which um, the, the abandonment of that term becomes really important once you are already living in a space in which you are not defining yourself um, in relationship to your own exclusions. Um, and so that, that's the whole point of the Hawthorne archive is to um, kind of get in that space. So on the one hand, you can see it as, okay, here's a set of historical episodes and stories and some of it's a lot, most of it's got a real historical element to it that that's kind of parts of it fictionally, fictionally rendered um, of forms of political opposition and forms of oppositional thought that have never been considered utopian. That's, that's the whole point of it. The whole point of it is that no one thought that um, people running away from slavery or soldiers putting their weapons down or people creating um, maroon communities would have been a model for even what utopianism might have meant. And so the, the point here is not to get into the, what is the word utopian? What is, what is it not so much? Should we call it utopian? Should we call it this topic? I mean, the only reason that you would need a consciousness and a str struggle for something better is because you're living in this mess of dispossession and violence and exploitation and so on. So the dis topic, the you topic, they're, they're bound together. They're, they're in a relationship with each other in that sense. So in many ways, the whole project is about, um, you could say it simply that it, there, it's a project in which after you answer the, after you say, well, what might the utopian look like if we had completely different models for it. Once you answer that question, then you're no longer in the space of the utopian anymore. You're, you're someplace else. I, I don't know what to call it. It doesn't even maybe need a name per se. I mean, it's just like, well, what happens around? So that, then it becomes the name that's important is the Hawthorne archive, and not so much the question of the utopian or the utopian margins. This is again, from within that world, when you're in that world, you don't need the language of the utopian. And of course you, you so in that sense, um, you know, in terms of what, you know, your point, Jeffrey, that, um, you know, that somehow um, black and indigenous folks make utopia an impossibility only from within the canonical notion of utopia. If, if you um, are just thinking from within the space of black and indigenous radical possibility, then of course there's lots of radical possibility. I don't care whether you call it utopian or not, you can say it's a utopian margins, you can't. This is, from my point of view, the least important part of it. <laughs> what is important is that however we name and um and have some way of identifying those those radical traditions and what they throw up and how they intersect sometimes they don't 
and the kind of um, inheritances that they pass along. And the, the reason for the past, present, future is partially in order to, um, to keep the deeper historical liens present because they get lost. Um, I mean, it's just hard to hold them. And um, so they, it's to me important to, to keep them there as something, bodies of knowledge and forms of practice that, um, that we have some relationship to, however attenuated it is. I mean, I'm not sure I'm answering the sophisticated level of the questions very well, but um, it's, and I'm not even sure that the form of this book works particularly well. Um, and, but it's, yeah, it just is how it, <laughs> I can't do anything about that now. But, but it does raise questions for me about, um, um, I have been um, working a lot around the question of banishment and, um, and thinking about that a lot and doing quite a bit of research on that. And um, in part because I spent a lot of time um, and work doing research on, um, on imprisonment and the, to understand it in its longer historical fetch um, and not just in the historiography that we've created for the US prison industrial complex, I think is really important to understand how it works and how it works not just in the US, but but in other other places, um, and so, and I'm not at all sure really about what the form of that writing is really going to take, um, and I'm trying to think about that now in other terms as well. So, yeah. Thanks. We have um, a comment from Lauren McDaniel, and she loved the talk, and uh, she. Uh, she agrees about the disciplines. I'm, I'm, I noticed in the talk you were not, not, not invested in talking about in, in disciplinarity, but Lauren is asking disciplines don't hear each other at all. And then we have a question from uh, Christian Khoury, who uh, she, uh, Christian um, saying thanks for the incredible talk. May I ask who you cited as the book who talks about anti-archive, recovered archives, archives as place, as a method, as a technique of state power? Yes, um, Anne Spektovich, and I put her name in the chat. Excellent. Um, um, she's, um, is, uh, is TK still with us? because TK's, the name of TK's um, radio program, Archive of Feelings, is also the name of um, one of Anne's books. Yes, Anne is a, good, is a, is a friend. <laughs> yeah, so that's who Anne is. She's, um, she's someone who has thought a lot about archives. Um, and um, I mean, someone also I've known a very long time and had a lot of conversations with her about about that, the Hawthorne Archive book and archives in, in general. Um, yeah. So, thanks. So this is Kali, I just have a quick question um, and it's probably very easy question. Where does your- Thank you, Kali. An easy <laughs> question would be very welcome. <laughs> it should be very, very easy. Um, where does your correspondence, your final correspondence with E, your last correspondence fit into the Hawthorne archive? Okay, so that is what I would, so that's a good question. Um, that, um, there, there <laughs> it's, um, this is my way of, in effect, keeping the, if you like the reality of the Hawthorne archive going and still alive. Um, it's also um, 
what I was just saying to Atef about um, what form this project on banishment is going to take. You know, should it just become an extension? Like, do I want to basically, um, if you like, create documents that will go into the Hawthorne archive or something else? And I think the answer is something else, but it's- It sounds like something else, but then it also sounds like it's attached. So this, yeah, I mean, this was something that I just was kind of trying to create for for you guys today. Um, no problem. I think for, it's okay. yeah. for the conference to kind of keep it, you know, sort of rolling, but also to I think give um, give more give something of a sense of what the materials from the Hawthorne archive, if people haven't read the book or encountered it in any other way what they sound like. They don't, they all sound different, but some of them sound a lot like, like this, um, where people, um, because in fact, that's, yeah, I mean, people do still write to me and ask me <laughs> questions, um, they do. And um, my website is down, but when it was up, you would really be, um, yeah, I used to get quite a few formal requests for me to, you know, make things available and when people could come and see things and so on. And so, um, but yeah. Um, Thank you for that. Thank you. So we are about time. Mark, you decide about the last question. And Kaylee, there's two more questions actually coming right now. Um, actually, um, if there is a way, uh, I think that the um, Naya Easley's question and Janice Radway's question, they could possibly be rolled together in a way to talk about, um, maybe if you could read Janice's um, question. I, that's definitely something that- I'm, It's gonna be really hard. Let me look at it. Jan, you've probably asked me a really hard question. Let me see. Um, Ephemerality. Uh-huh, okay. Okay, so, um, um, so Janice, Janice saying the question says um, that a question about what seems a tension in your thinking in the Hawthorne archive between ephemerality and something I would call categorical thinking or fixedness. You often use gerunds to get at flight, motion, movement, direction. So I'm wondering whether the utopian margins are always ephemeral, which is to say non-productive. And then um, Nia is asking about the social role of the archive, accessibility, legibility for people interested in creating an archive of this moment we are in. What advice would you give? So I think what I, um, I think what I would say to you, Jan, is that yes, I think there is a tension. Um, perhaps less atten attention in my thinking than attention in the Hawthorne archive as a project um, between what you're calling ephemerality and, and you know, categorical thinking or fixedness. Um, I don't think that the utopian margins are always ephemeral or non-productive. In fact, I think there's just a simple, there's a simple definition of that I mean, it's like it's a little bit gussied up, the utopian margins, but I really think of it as a way of um, describing all of our everyday life practices, whether they're intellectual practices, family practices, eating practices, friendship practices, social movement practices, in which we are 
in some ways um, creating the world that we would like to be the dominant one, but that isn't yet. And that in these life forms, we are doing the kind of eminent politics that is all we've got at the moment in terms of how we are going to be able not just to smash the state or get rid of the police, but how we are going to be in charge of living a life we want. I mean, you know, um, June Jordan famously said, there's no one else but us. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is no waiting for someone to come and then tell us, give us the better world we want. We have to make this. And that's not to say that the state shouldn't do this or that. I'm just saying we, that's for us. We have to do that. We have to be prepared as individuals living in communities and families and so, collectives and so on to, to do that, to have thought about that. This project originally started with that really basic problem is that everybody involved in radical politics put such a premium on critique that they could not put a sentence together saying what they wanted instead. And they were embarrassed and ashamed at what they had to say about that. And I just found that just trouble for us, you know, because it's, it's far more important for us to know what we want and for our critique to develop from that than to have the critique first, because then how do you know what you want? You know, so it's that, that is much harder and it's much more embarrassing for people to say, well, what do I want? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's so that to me is the crucial political project. And one of the things about um, the, the moment, the political moment that we're in now is that is, I think, really very exciting is how many more people are really getting that um, the state cannot solve the problem that they create, that the solution has to come from us and we have to build it and make it. And it's a lot of work and there's a lot of conflicts and disagreements and trouble involved in that. But it's more and more people I think are really seeing that. And I think that's a really amazing element of um, what it means to call, for example, to abolish the police. Because everybody is also then having to say, well, and here's what we, here's how we want it instead. We don't want that, we want this. And that's, I think that's incredibly exciting right, right now and really important. So, I mean, that's to me what the utopian margins are. That's what this idea of preparation is. What are you doing to be ready to live in the world that you want to be in? You know, to, to not hold so close to you the, the pain and the violence and the, I mean, it's not to say, not to make pretend that it's not there, but to carve out that space for, um, for living where it's not totally who we are because it isn't it, it just doesn't become us completely in that way and i think that so nia has this question about the social role of the archive creating an archive of this this moment i think that um i mean so many people, there's really, I mean, in some ways, what is that? It depends what the, what the meaning of archive means to you. So that's what I was trying to say about the Hawthorne archive. It isn't so much an archive in the way we traditionally understand that, and that maybe it was badly named. It's a name for, it's a name for a community. And so there will be hundreds of them. <laughs> so how do you, how would you then be archiving your community and struggle? Um, 
and however that however you want to do that and there are lots of people doing that i think lots of folks doing it So Mark and Keely. Uh, thank you so much for um, for that. Um, I we are um, now at um, yeah close to five o'clock. Sorry for keeping you after. Thank you so much, Avery. This was such a fantastic talk. Um, Kelly, did you want to? Thank you so much. I'm um, thanking everyone. Thank you, Professor Gordon, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. This has been, I mean, this is, I think, for both Mark and I, um, more than we could have imagined when we first started discussing a conference. So um, this was exceptional to me. These are the kinds of conversations that I want to have. I want to be in community with um, a multi, I, I love telling stories. So let me just tell a story. So one of my, I've done a lot of things in my life and I started out uh, training as an actor. And uh, one of the things that the, the person that I was, um, he was, I was his apprentice. Uh, one of the things that he would repeat to us all the time, he said, you know, I'm an actor and I've been acting for years and um, I can tell you that none of my friends are actors. He said, I have friends that are, you know, scientists and, um, you know, academics. And um, so this is how I feel about being um, an archivist and a special collections librarian is that I want to have conversations with uh, many different people and uh, continue these conversations and critique the archive. When I work with students uh, in the reading room, I am often taking a critical approach to the archive, which um, a lot of uh, disciplined faculty really appreciate. Um, so thank you all so much for agreeing to participate and I look forward to seeing you all in the future. Maybe we can do something where we're all in the same space. That would be wonderful. Um, I think I'm going on too long. I'm gushing now. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, every single one of you, TK, uh, Professor Gordon, Professor Fuentes. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think we can all maybe, I don't know what the time situation is, but it's time for dinner over here. It yes. is. <laughs> thank, thank you all so much. I just wanted to add my appreciation to Kelly's for all of our presenters. It's just been an incredible two days. I've learned so much and I've felt so much. This has been a conference where, you know, there've been lots of emotions, um, stirred as well as you know a lot of ideas exchanged and this really makes me excited about the future collaborations that can be sparked and the community that we can bring forward into the future um so um thank you all so much and also thank you so much to the audience um for your generous participation and questions all the way through. I look at the names of people in the audience and my gosh, it's like a conference that could be had right now with the people tuning in. So thank you all for participating um, and be safe and be well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for all the organizing. It was really a wonderful two days. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Get some rest, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Kelly. Thanks for your Bye, help. Mark. We'll debrief later. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs>